really fun um, a really fun day ahead. Hopefully today might be a little lighter in the sense that we're not going to dive really deeply into some new technologies or models or you know you're not probably going to see a lot of uh, you know you're, we're not going to go through any new narratives or download any software but what we're going to do is I, th I would say the way I'm kind of viewing this is is today or today is our aspirational day so today is the day we think about all the things that we've learned over the course of the week we put them in the context of some science problems that was going to be presented by our presenters today and then we start to think and dream about what it is we might do with all of the things we've been talking about and realizing again that the things you've heard about this week are not things that are well developed and finely tuned they're things that are really on the cutting edge the bleeding edge of of, of new developments and new science so um, it's, it's really great that this community can come together and learn about these things and then dream together about how to improve them and use them to improve all of our science collectively. So um, we're going to have four presentations today by experts in a variety of different application areas. Uh, we're going to start with Christoph in marine and lacustrine systems. Marco's going to talk about plant soil microbe. Uh, Xingyan in watershed systems and Pamela in wetland systems. And another exciting thing we have that I'm really looking forward to and encourage you to join is the 1015 session. We'll have a number of our uh, selected students that have been working in the hands-on sessions throughout the week give us some flash talks on their own research and um, how they envision using some of these tools in their research. And then we'll have a little bit of presentations at 1130, again, a uh, summary of some resources and opportunities um, from the Department of Energy's um, facilities and other resources. So again, just an opportunity for you to learn how to engage further in the future and um, apply some of the things we've been learning. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Christoph. Oh, before I do that, I just want to say, hang in there. Um, somebody, <laughs> post <laughs> somebody posted this. I think it was Andrea, but um, <laughs> if you're feeling that way, uh, hang in there because I think that we're going to quite soon see some uh, some fruit of all of our labors. So, Christoph, um, I'm going to stop sharing and ask Christoph Myla from the University of Georgia to take over. All right. Uh, can you confirm that you see my screen? Yes, I see your screen in presentation mode. All right. Uh, so it's. Uh, Nice uh, start to my presentation with the dog. I hope I'm uh, alleviating some of the pain. It has been a great week. Uh, I have actually learned quite a bit and uh, I'm happy to share some uh, uh, thoughts about uh, modeling of uh, uh, reactive transport uh, linked to microbial dynamics in marine systems. And uh, what I'm gonna do today is uh, um, give a brief start off with uh, recapping some of the things that we have seen um, earlier in this week uh, just to highlight a few of the key features about reactive transport models and how they have uh, allowed us to get to a point where we are today and move into the future and um, i'm going to then switch and present a few applications uh, from my own group looking at uh, methane oxidation in marine sediments under anaerobic conditions uh, I then will present uh, two papers that I have nothing to do with, but uh, I wanted uh, to show some work that has been done uh, looking at uh, omics informed uh, processes in uh, modeling water column processes and then end with some closing uh, remarks. And just to, to kind of set the scene, I have here a, a slide that um, uh, shows some of these uh, features in marine system. Uh, this is kind of looking at carbon cycling in marine system where we have uh, productivity in the photic zone in the surface ocean that is fueling the processes that happen at depth. We have the export of particular organic matter to greater depth through the biological pump, for example. And this organic matter is then being acted upon or broken down through a bunch of microorganisms, including uh, heterotrophic uh, bacteria, for example. There's the viral shunt that essentially brings back some of that material into, back into the DUM pool uh, and so on. So as you can see here, this is a rather complex system. Uh, that ultimately is also embedded into larger scale uh, food wraps. And 
Only a small portion of what is being produced in the surface ocean makes it down to the bottom of the seafloor. This is the environment I tend to be working on. And a couple of key questions here that one might be interested in how listed here on the left, you know, related to carbon dynamics, nutrient dynamics, or ultimately the uh, removal of organic matter and burial of uh, reduced carbon uh, over long time scale in marine sediments. Um, I want to start off with uh, this picture here that uh, looks at the uh, reactive transport model um, that uh, this is work by Yi Feng Wang, who was a postdoc at that time with uh, my PhD advisor, Philippe van Capellen. And this is essentially the figure that Tim already uh, used previously. And it illustrates uh, what reactive transport models are, are good at, right? So they essentially allow you to kind of deconvolute uh, different processes, how they affect uh, the elemental cyclings here. The figure highlights uh, the fate of iron, at least what uh, we thought that was uh, the case back in, in the mid 90s. So we have the deposition of um, uh, iron three that gets reduced through organic matter mineralization, uh, but also interaction with uh, sulfide and then re-oxidized. And some of it is ultimately uh, being transported back and potentially leaves uh, sediment again as uh, benthic fluxes. And so we can describe these type of things using reactive transport models as it's depicted down here. And the interesting part really is the reactions. I think, at least to me, the most interesting part is the reactions and the processes uh, that transform different chemicals uh, into each, each other. So. The question is, okay, this was in the mid 90s where a couple of these efforts has been, been uh, promoted. There's work from Colin Sutar, there's uh, uh, Bernie Boudreau's work, um, aside from what I have just shown you. And <clears throat> what are the new things? What, uh, what are we better at now than we used to be, uh, be at there? And one of the, those aspects I think is that uh, we have made some progress in the integration of data. And so we have uh, results from models that you can compare with measurements. Uh, we quantify the misfit into some objective function, and we can essentially systematically adapt uh, many parameters that typically are involved in this type uh, of modelings to improve the, uh, how the model results corresponds or matches uh, the measurements. Now, uh, because many of these uh, modeling efforts are relatively rich in parameters, uh, this is a rather important process. And so we have this parameterization that uh, essentially connects the chemistry that we observe with B representing the microbes that essentially drive most of these elemental cycles that we, that we see. So we have tools to, to, to deal with that. Now, during this week, we have heard quite a bit uh, about uh, cell models. These are some representations thereof. I, um, there's very little I can add to what uh, 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 Yong Sang already uh, discussed earlier in this week. And these cell models represented here, for example, in the form of FBAs, uh, uh, essentially aim at uh, or provide us some information about uh, cellular activity or growth efficiencies um, uh, by being informed uh, by omics data. And here on the right, you see a representation of some work that a grad student, a former grad student of mine ha have been doing, uh, looking at uh, cell models uh, using a more of a kinetic approach, uh, looking at the kinetics of central metabolism here of Geobacter uh, in particular. The second way where we have really made uh, pr progress is kind of what uh, uh, was highlighted in uh, the talk by Owen Brody and uh, colleagues also earlier in the week, where we take information uh, about uh, what we know about microbes and relate that to parameters that are of interest, uh, for example, growth efficiencies uh, uh, in our uh, reactive transport modeling effort. The two figures here, this was uh, what he referred to as this uh, codon using bio, uh, bias uh, uh, that he discussed, Owen discussed earlier. And then I thought it was really nice um, in terms of what uh, the summer school is, because as soon as he said, I saw on the Discord pop up a few more relationships that people put up with papers that, that uh, essentially aim at the same thing, taking omics data and relating it to properties that are central to uh, reactive uh, transport models. 
So the second thing that I think we have made uh, progress on is illustrated here is that uh, because we have better computers, we are actually able to resolve a couple of things that we couldn't do in the early days. And one topic that is of particular of interest to mine are, um, uh, is, is shown up here. So this is a picture from a paper by Eric Christensen and colleagues. And what it shows, this is in a sediment here, so a couple of centimeters, and you see this U-shaped structure, which is uh, the remnant of, this is a burrow uh, of an organism. And you see, hopefully, that you know the coloration here between the sediment and surrounding the burrow is distinct, which is indicative of uh, distinct redox conditions associated uh, with these uh, burrow structures. This is also reflected in some work that uh, uh, Niels Volkmann ha has been having a uh, leading, and he has uh, used uh, planar optodes. Uh, here I'm showing you a result from uh, 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 one that measures oxygen. And this is again, this we are looking at, at a cross section in sediment. You can do that by essentially using ant farms, so thin aquaria. You put one of these planar optodes on the side and you take pictures. And these pictures really reflect the variation in the concentration field of oxygen. So here we have an anoxic sediment down here. We have the oxygenated uh, overlying water, strong transition because it's a, a carbon rich environment, but then you have this feature and this feature is associated with a bivalve living down here and uh, moving water uh, around that leads to the intrusion of oxygen into an anoxic sediment. Now this is here a spatial feature, but this is also something that is highly uh, dynamic. These animals pump. Um, and move water around. So on this axis, you see time. This is over an hour. Uh, this is a cross section here through this uh, shown here B. And you see that there's oxygen present. Oxygen uh, has been used up present uh, and being anoxic again in between. And the white line here is a, is a measure of pressure and an indicator of the pumping activities of these organisms. Now, and we are now able, or have been for a couple of years now, uh, able to make, uh, relate these uh, observations uh, um, to uh, modeling efforts. And I think that the beauty here that I wanted to highlight is that we have a limited number of chemicals that we can measure like that. So for example, oxygen, but you know, we can build on that and using a reactive transport model, we can like, essentially expand on that and make predictions that are informed with by actually some data up here, make these predictions for all the chemicals that might be of interest, for example, related here to the nitrogen cycle. The third thing that I think we have made quite some progress on is making these codes more user friendly. And I know that may come to seem like a stretch for, uh, to some of the people uh, who are not doing this for a living, but I also want to stress, I mean, you saw that during this week, I mean, the ability to run really complex simulations very, very quickly, I mean, is to me quite staggering. And this has been highlighted by a number of talks that uh, have been given earlier you know, this week here in the context of pole flow trans, some of the web interfaces or the sandbox that is part of that. I myself have been involved in uh, some other uh, efforts where uh, we uh, that essentially couple the symbolic expressions that you introduce into Maple. So you can basically write down reactions more or less as what you do uh, on paper and you can integrate that in an automated fashion uh, and uh, okay, uh, create uh, corresponding Jacobian matrices and so on that uh, are directly used to then uh, do uh, simulations uh, uh, in, in you know, um, some other complex reactive transport models. And I think this is important because it uh, really allows us to be linking our work uh, more closely to some of the stuff that uh, also you have seen earlier. So this is uh, uh, some graphs out of the uh, Kelly Wrighton's lab. And uh, as you have seen using DRAM, uh, we can take information uh, from sequencing efforts and essentially then link it back to, um, you know, an infer functionality uh, in the environment. And so here, you know, we can adapt our reaction networks and account for, you know, here the absence of, uh, say, dissimilatory nitrate reduction uh, to ammonium. So this is in a nutshell, kind of a recap of some of the work that uh, uh, 
and I think is important that uh, facilitates this microbial uh, reactive transport models. I want to switch gear now and um, talk a little bit about work that is, uh, uh, my lab was involved in. And as I said, I want to talk about anaerobic methane oxidation in marine sediments. And just to give a little bit of context here, now we are looking at the concentration profiles of sulfate, methane, uh, as a function of depth in, uh, in, in a marine sediment core. You see the depletion of sulfate here, uh, and uh, methane essentially is only present uh, below the zone where sulfate has been uh, uh, depleted when you do rate measurements uh, uh, using uh, sulfur, uh, sulfate that is labeled with 35 uh, sulfur, you can essentially measure that, you know, these regions, transition regions are uh, places where we have high uh, rates of sulfate production. So the geochemists have told us for you know, literally decades uh, that this is essentially what is happening. And um, about 20 years ago, um, then uh, 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 the microbiologists uh, here, a paper by Antti Bertius, uh, and uh, I think uh, Kai Uwe Hinrichs was involved in that, uh, looked at uh, what they found there. They observed these uh, aggregates consisting of archaea and bacteria, and they inferred that, that these uh, aggregates were involved in this process of anaerobic methane oxidation. We have uh, looked at that uh, from a modeling perspective, and we looked at it in a couple of different scales. It is kind of highlighted up here. We have done some work really at the large scale, uh, asking, you know, looking at in a more in a classic reactive transport modeling sense of, you know, what are the dynamics and the environmental conditions that you would observe uh, here in, in, in a seep site. And so this is work uh, by Julian Rose. Um, and what he did is essentially looked at a quantified some uh, uh, flow in uh, seep environments in, in uh, and non both seep and non seep environments in the Gulf of Mexico using uh, radium uh, as tracers and then coupled it with reactive transport models that accounted, for example, for methane oxidation and then the production of this leads, uh, this, uh, leads to production of alkalinity. This alkalinity then stimulates the formation of calcium carbonate. This calcium carbonate has an impact on the permeability and so he looked at how does flow dynamics uh, of uh, fluid flow uh, uh, dynamics, what they are expected to change. Uh, over time. So this is kind of the environmental setting. Uh, we also looked at it in a, at a very, very small scale, okay? So focusing on these aggregates themselves. And this was motivated by some work that uh, I had done with Beth Orcutt when she did uh, her PhD with Mandy Joy. And we did some modeling of this type uh, of, of, of microbial aggregates. Um, now, uh, a few years ago then, uh, um, I mean, we teamed uh, up with uh, Victoria Orphan and her lab really had done some quite interesting things because they looked at these aggregates at, uh, at the aggregate scale. Uh, they looked at the, their activity distribution using nanosims, so looking at the nitrogen uptake as a, uh, within aggregates and they also looked at uh, their genomes. And one thing that they encountered is that uh, what they found is that uh, um, uh, this uh, multi-heme cytochromes were rather abundant in uh, some of these organisms involved in this here, uh, highlighting these uh, enemy uh, uh, groups up here. And so what they suggested based on this is that, uh, that the interactions between the bacteria and the archaea in this uh, 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 microbial consortia is not necessarily linked to uh, the diffusion of dissolved uh, electron donors, but maybe something that is more looks like that, uh, direct interspecies electron transfer. And a grad student of mine, Xiao Xia He, uh, he uh, teamed up with uh, uh, Greg Ch um, uh, Chadwick uh, from Victoria Orphan's lab uh, to, to model this type of systems. And what you see here on the bottom right is uh, kind of the data that we were using. So this is the, the, the fish data. We see the archaea and the bacteria uh, in different colors in here. And then this is the uh, N15 uh, measurements that uh, uh, were made uh, wrote, uh, in, in the orphan lab using nanosims. So 
um, we essentially took this type of, of data, cell densities, arrangements, and environmental conditions in some of their incubations, combined it with um, some work that we found in the literature describing extracellular electron transport. And we put this into a, a small scale reactive transport model accounting for thermodynamics uh, of, of these reactions as well. And uh, we essentially, our model simulation supported the idea that, you know, that molecular diffusion is not fast enough and that uh, in order to explain this type of activity patterns uh, uh, is, is really something we need to have faster transport and, for example, related to this uh, uh, direct interspecies uh, electron from transfers. And so we, this is something that we, uh, we looked at and some of Xiaoxia's uh, work shows that quite nicely. Uh, now, so I talked about, you know, work that happened at the really large scale here, kind of looking at the environmental conditions and work that happens at the aggregate scale. But uh, I want to focus now on something that uh, kind of happens uh, 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 in between. And this is work uh, by uh, Himon Yang. He's also here in the summer school. Uh, and I'm sure he's going to be happy to talk to you guys all about this in uh, more detail on the Discord server. But what he did is essentially established a poor scale model that is uh, kind of depicted here on the left hand side is the Lattice Boltzmann uh, modeling approach. And uh, with that, he can essentially simulate, uh, you know, solve Navier Stokes equation, so simulate the flow here. In, uh, in, in, in port channels. And they coupled that, the next step is to solve uh, an advaction diffusion reaction equation to simulate uh, the dynamics of chemicals and biomass. And we use this for a couple of applications highlighted uh, down here. And if I wanna highlight uh, just uh, the, uh, the first one here, for, uh, which we, we use this type of models of the, of the pore scale um, to, uh, address the question of how much does it matter if you're not resolving the pore scale. Uh, and so he did simulations under a different range of flow and reaction conditions, for looking at uh, reactions where um, uh, the substrate is being used up uh, by uh, microorganisms that are distributed uh, somewhere, you know, at uh, discrete locations within uh, these uh, modeling uh, domains. And so explicitly doing these type of simulations, he then found that uh, he was able to quantify the, uh, you know, how bad are we doing if you're not resolving the pore scale for these particular uh, types of reactions. And so here is kind of an outcome of these type of simulations. The details are in a recent paper uh, that he published. Uh, what you see here on the different axes, this is the dam color number, which shows the how, how important is reaction relative to advection component. And on this is a Peckle number, which gives you a measure of how important is advection relative to uh, diffusion. The vertical axis is a measure of the misfit. Okay, this is what we refer to as R1. This is the naive estimate of reaction rates if you only look at bulk properties. And we compare this to the actual volume average reaction rates if you're resolving these poor scale simulations. And you see that depending on the flow and reaction conditions, you get a, a, a variation of about uh, up to a, a factor of four of something like that for this type of reactions that uh, we were uh, studying here. We also found that the actual distribution of the microbes is maybe a little bit of a lesser important, uh, at least under the conditions that we studied. Um, we also looked at it, a few other things, looked at uh, uh, um, communication between microorganisms in the context of forum sensing, and then uh, feedback of biofilm growth on the transfer properties uh, in the porous media. I'm not going to talk about these things. I'm sure here one is happy to chat with you if you're interested in that. Uh, but I do want to go back to this last uh, part here is um, connecting it back up to this uh, metabolism because this was one of the key motivation for developing uh, this uh, type of models. And so in the project uh, that uh, supports this type of work, this is uh, supported by DOE uh, Genomic Sciences, uh, led by Victoria Orphan. Uh, Chris Henry is part of that project as well. And you heard him talk earlier about some of these things that they're working on. So they are looking at to, to build these flux balance models for some of these archaea and the sulfate reducers that we are really interested in the context uh, of, uh, of uh, AON, right? So, so we have a connection with that. 
And after hearing uh, his of Hung, songs talk about uh, yesterday, I think we will certainly go and look at uh, how we can speed up some of these simulations. So uh, again, I think this is a really nice part about the summer school. I mean, you guys get exposed to some cutting edge work that I think has really great potential as you move uh, forward as well. Okay, so in a nutshell, some of this work that I have uh, shown you here, uh, I want to show that we use the reactive transport more and more in a classic sense to provide some context in space and time. Uh, we can use it to look at interactions here, uh, the work that we did with the aggregates. And I think what is really important here, and um, particularly in the context of the summer school, is that we can use these models kind of uh, to connect scales and link up microbial uh, met metabolism, particularly to the post scale and then ultimately to larger scale, uh, uh, which, which was shown in uh, Hebron uh, Young's work. I want to switch gears here uh, and talk a little bit uh, uh, about work of other people. So I hope I don't butcher that, but I think it's important because it kind of gives you a little bit of a broader uh, perspective. And uh, uh, it, there is actually, after I put this together, I, I found this, this, this paper by Helwego, really nice summary that essentially boils this down. And so if you're interested in this, uh, go maybe start here. That gives you a good overview. And then before you dig into some of the individual papers that uh, 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 Ferdi Helwego uh, is uh, discussing. And I'm going to highlight two aspects here. Um, one is looking at nitrogen and sulfur cycling in uh, oxygen minimum zones. And the other one, it looks at uh, connecting ocean by geochemistry with uh, some uh, trade based uh, model. And just to set the scene here, so we the first example, we're looking at oxygen minimum zones. So these are environment uh, uh, that you find, for example, in the Arabian Sea over here, in the eastern tropical Pacific, both in the north and the south here. And these are environments where the, uh, the, the oxygen in the water column basically uh, goes down to essentially uh, zero. And it's quite exciting in, in a sense, because as you know, uh, when you run out of oxygen, the biogeochemistry, you know, um, gets, uh, how should I say, interesting or more interesting even. Uh, and particularly when you look at uh, some of these uh, uh, processes when it comes to uh, nitrogen cycle, you know, denitrification, anamox, discriminatory nitrate reduction to ammonium and so on, but also uh, linked to the sulfur cycle uh, shown here. Okay, so but, uh, Dan Reed uh, did together with uh, Chris Zolg, Julie Huber, and uh, Greg Dick is they, they essentially studied one of these environments. They looked at the, at the water column profiles in the Arabian Seas, used data from a paper by a pitcher and colleagues from, from the NEOS that uh, they collected on a cruise uh, a little bit earlier. And the way they, they, they went about uh, looking at this system is as follows. So, they, they built a reactive transport model that involved the organic matter mineralization uh, linked with oxygen, uh, nitrate, nitrite, sulfate, uh, uh, and so on, okay? So in addition to that, then they uh, accounted for aerobic oxidation processes involving some of these reduced species, sulfate and ammonium in nitrification and so on. And then finally, they also uh, considered uh, anamox and uh, sulfide oxidation uh, with uh, nitrite. And, and so you can do this, you can essentially put this into a reactive transport model where you solve, you know, the, 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 the chemical dynamics uh, due to uh, the transport processes and then these reactions that are shown here. The transport in this case was basically parameterized based on water columns uh, stability measurements, so relating to the observations and salinity and uh, temperature profile. Now, nothing new here, I would say, but what they did then is they essentially um, introduced uh, marker genes for these uh, different processes uh, that are listed in here. And they essentially looked at the, the temporal evolution of these marker genes as well, subject to transport uh, reactions, and then also, you know, basically, basically a, a decay or a death term uh, that removes uh, uh, these uh, genes uh, again. And then they simulated this uh, reaction rate as a function of you know, uh, growth parameters, uptake parameters, um, processes uh, you know, are, uh, depend on the availability of substrate 
the machinery person to process these substrates, some inhibitors, and then uh, the energetics. I'm simplifying this slightly, but that's kind of the gist of what, uh, uh, what, they, what they did. And uh, the good news is, I mean, they were able to reproduce the main features in the concentration profiles here. This is profiles now not in the sediment, but in the water column. So we have about uh, 2,000 meters of water depth with oxygen. The, the dots or the, the markers here, these are the measurements and the lines are uh, their concentration, simulated concentration profiles. And so the main features, something that they represent, uh, were able to reproduce. But also, I think more importantly, is that uh, they were able, uh, their model kind of uh, mimic the distribution of uh, these marker genes as it is highlighted here for uh, ammonium oxidation here or animox features here as well. And then they looked also and kind of related to the production or uh, uh, the, the dynamics in, in, in these genes, and they rel basically related that to uh, the messenger RNA as well. And maybe, uh, and there's another way is they essentially, you know, were, the model led to an, uh, a result that was consistent with the understanding of what's happening in the Arabian seas where DN, denitrification is exceeding animox uh, as a, uh, process to produce uh, N2. Now, so you could say, well, you know, you've probably seen better fits, and what's the big deal? And I think um, what was really nice about uh, that work is uh, that uh, it's kind of illustrated in here. Now, this it was a setting where there was uh, no uh, sulfide uh, was uh, de detected in, in the system. And you can essentially have a couple of uh, ways how you get to that. First of all, you may not have production of sulfide, so no sulfate reduction uh, taking place in the system. Or you may have a system where you have sulfate reduction taking place, but then the sulfide that, uh, um, well, I guess, uh, that has been produced is being reoxidized uh, quickly. And using their model, what they were showing is that when you did look at these two scenarios, um, for many of the chemical profiles, they look relatively sim similar. There's some difference here in the nitride uh, profile, uh, where uh, one may argue that maybe this is a distinguishing feature between these two scenarios. But what is really uh, uh, striking is that uh, the model produces a very, very different distribution uh, of genes, okay? And so, using these genes basically as a biomarker of indicator of processes. And that is essentially what the people have seen experimentally. This is a paper by Tom Canfield and colleagues where they looked at uh, this very question at the different side. This is uh, an oxygen minimum zone here uh, of Chile. This is the concentration profiles that you see here for, uh, you know, here oxygen in blue. Uh, in the top 200 meters of the water column. So you're running out of oxygen around 60 meters. This is a place where then they find high sulfide oxidation rates. And they also saw evidence of uh, a significant abundance of genes that are involved in active uh, sulfur cycle. Okay, so first application here. The second one that I wanted to briefly talk about is uh, uh, how you can use omics or connecting it to uh, looking at uh, phytoplankton community distribution. And this is uh, work that is, um, uh, the groundwork has been laid uh, by Mick Follows and uh, Stephanie Dukiev, Dukiewicz. And they essentially uh, establish a, a, a setting. And again, you have seen similar uh, picture like that, I think in Owen's talk early in the week, where he looked at the information about this uh, based on the genetics and the physiology of organisms. You combine them with the environment, you have a basically a competition uh, between different organisms that have different traits uh, that leads to emergence of an ecosystem structure and, and, and function. And this was quite successful. They actually were able to uh, kind of reproduce some of the key features of the biogeography uh, community structure that was arising uh, and they were essentially selecting for organisms that are, you know, you know, I would say uh, uh, similar to some of the important organisms that we see uh, in, in nature as well. Now, Victoria uh, Coles and uh, colleagues, including some uh, from my own department up here, um, built on, on this work and they essentially uh, looked at a situation uh, uh, across uh, the, the Atlantic. Uh, they used a uh, physical oceanography model using HICOM to simulate the, the, the transport uh, of uh, and the flow uh, of water. Uh, they combined that with a model that uh, 
uh, accounted for uh, 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 about 70 uh, microorganisms that differed in size. There was a random selection of uh, what these traits were uh, being. They said they are size dependent substrate, affinity, and so on. But then these organisms could do a bunch of different things. So they had about 20 um, uh, different uh, biochemical functions uh, that. Uh, uh, could be selected for that in, included, uh, you know, can they use light? Are these nitrifiers? Can they move around? And uh, do they, are they nitrogen fixes? And so on, okay? And they essentially simulated these organisms uh, with the, having these different traits here. And these traits were linked to, again, to some uh, what uh, may call uh, marker genes. And they looked at the, what was emerging in terms of community structure and in terms of the uh, uh, chemical signatures, uh, as well as the gene distribution and the transcription levels uh, that were associated uh, uh, with these uh, simulations. So again, using a natural selection approach, if you're not successful, if you're one of these 70 organisms and you're not successful, you got replaced by an, uh, another random seeds and so on. So the system is basically allowed to uh, evolve. And the, here is uh, the, the, the key result, I think, from their feature was that uh, they did a bunch of different models on, and the emergent metabolic function of the ocean biogeochemistry was relatively stable. And there's kind of, uh, what this shows here is kind of the, the model domain that is shown up here. This is the distribution of genes in the, in the models uh, in the background, and the circles are uh, the observation data. Comparing this is a measure of the transcripts here, and again comparing the uh, simulation results with uh, the data here uh, in in circles. Okay, and so they found a reasonable uh, correspondence between the model and the measurements. They found that the similar metabolic functions would be expressed in different uh, uh, model runs, and again these are randomly seeded. So. Uh, important finding, but what they also found is that the emerging microbial community actually was quite different. And I think in a nutshell, what that means, it's really uh, that uh, we can, uh, we had an emerging of different uh, microbial communities, but they're kind of doing the same thing. And from a modeling perspective, that's actually quite helpful because it really allows us to uh, focus on some of the, of the functions. And the first part here, I want to stress again that I think we here the key take home message is omics that sees things that are not apparent in the chemistry, and we can use this in models. Now, I, the, the, there's, there's not much here in terms of the metabolome, so I wanted to briefly uh, switch gears uh, with uh, uh, regard uh, uh, to that. So, we have heard quite a bit about that in terms of how we can link organic matter, knowledge about organic matter to its reactivity. And, uh, you know, that goes back to some earlier work, you know, uh, shown in here. I don't have time to go into this, but there's uh, other paper here by Shannon Banner that kind of illustrates really that the molecular properties are, as title size, a primary control on the microbial utilization of dissolved organic matter in, in, in the ocean. And you have seen this graph before quite a few times, the work by Doug LaRoe and Philippe van Capellen, that relates the characteristics of the organic matter here, uh, nominal oxidation state, to the energetics. Okay? And so there's a great potential, and you saw that before by uh, Nudis, this bring this all together, looking at the lambda theory or looking at this joint microbial DOM characterization studies that are ongoing and Damsel is doing a great job uh, in, in that area. Uh, I do wanna uh, discuss a little bit more about that in terms of the environmental controls, because I think this is important. There's a couple of factors in the environment shown up here is temperature. Uh, this is work by Nat Vesson and Mandy Joy, and it really shows the temperature can change the relative importance of different uh, uh, pathways. Now, I do think that while uh, this is a complex system, this is sediment slurry sediment from the uh, coast of Georgia, but these are still complex systems, right? But I think the, the tools that we discussed today are, are probably helpful in uh, helping us understand some of these dynamics. Things get a little bit more, uh, uh, I think, more complex even is when you start to look at, you know, the interactions of minerals uh, with the organic matter. This is some old work, you know, um, by uh, Kyle, Meyer, of our ransom and so on. And there's a lot going on in, in this area also in the terrestrial environment. But I want to focus here on this last part a little bit. And this, what this shows is that 
this is uh, work by Eric Christensen again that uh, showed that uh, the organic matter pool in, in, in sediments that were either defaunated or uh, had aranicola marina, one of these worms that I mentioned earlier, is, is, can be hugely different, right? And so I think it's, I'm mentioning this is because we can have these additional controls that are not microbial, uh, that uh, both shape the dynamics in the systems uh, as well as the, um, and uh, can also shape the microbial community. This is work by Longhui Dang uh, that showed essentially looking at a bunch of different sites here uh, uh, between Sweden and Denmark, essentially, showed that the microbial community, both archaea and bacteria, are quite distinct in the non biotopated setting from the biotopated setting. So, the elephant or the hippo in, in the room here is that we can have important top down uh, control as well uh, on the processes that we are studying, and we have been very much focused, and, you know, for good reasons, on the microbial aspect. Uh, 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 as well. Now, this is important uh, for uh, uh, a number of reasons, and I think uh, I'm, I'm basically kind of running out of time, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But um, I did want to um, stress that there are other ways to kind of look at uh, this micro. Uh, a process not just as a bottom-down approach, but also looking at um, in the context of overall uh, a systems approach. And this is some work uh, by Joe Valino. I think I'm going to basically skip uh, through this, but I'm happy to talk about that. And the key here is that we, we, we may need to, when we have really complex systems, we may need to think about ways that allows us to capture some of this complexity, not just by adding in more and more and more microbes, and uh, because we also need to account for their interactions and so on. And I think that's something that uh, Pamela Weisenhorn is probably going to talk about more about uh, in this afternoon. Uh, but we need to uh, take into consideration the, uh, the, the need for also look at some other organizational uh, uh, principle in the context that may be arising in the context uh, when we have uh, food webs as a whole, not just microbial systems. Okay. We'll stop at 9.12 a.m. Okay, so again, these are approaches that all can also be linked to uh, uh, omics uh, uh, data. But uh, so I do want to basically end with this and leave a moment of uh, uh, time for discussion is that uh, uh, kind of what we saw this week is that we can have these emerging properties that result from the micro scale. And I think it's really important to also constraints to look at the macro scale. Uh, what, I think what is really promising these days is the combination of different data types, you know, both on uh, classic concentration distribution, but then connecting with uh, different omics times and understanding of the organic matter uh, and so on. I think this is to me is really, really exciting. It's, it's a huge challenge, but exciting. Um, I wanted to bring home really the usefulness of models to make some of these connections across these scales that you, you're, you're seeing in here. And I think I do want to stress again, you know, the, um, the challenges that you're facing to really account for some of the complexity and the interactions between microbes uh, themselves, between uh, not even talked about viruses uh, at all. And, but uh, also in terms of relationship to upper trophic levels uh, and so on, okay? And with this, uh, I just want to make sure that I acknowledge the people again that uh, are involved or have been involved in some of this work. Uh, Jörn Rose, who showed, I showed some work from the MRC modeling. Uh, uh, AOM work that uh, was uh, done in my group by uh, Xiao Xiaohe, and then he won uh, Yang's work. Uh, his partnership, the data comes from uh, Victoria Orphan's lab here. In particular, uh, it involved uh, Sean McLean, who is now in Tokyo and uh, Chris Campus. And then the work on the biotubation. This is stuff that I have been uh, doing together with Niels Wolkenborg and Ian Dreyer. Uh, and then the microbial connections here with uh, Mark Levers group at ETH. Uh, and here Long Rui Deng was the lead author on, on that study. And I think that's, that's all I have uh, uh, for today. I appreciate it. Uh, and I'm, I'm here to answer some questions if there's time. Okay, thank you, Christoph, for the first presentation to kick off our day. Um, actually, I don't 
think I've seen any questions come through yet. So, um, but we do have uh, over 150 people online and I'm thinking that the chat will pick up over in Discord pretty soon. So if anybody has questions for Christoph, um, please post them in the applications area or in the plenary session area over in Discord. Um, you've got uh, uh, kudos from one of the participants. Thank you for the overview of linking modeling with omics data. So um, hopefully we'll have some continued conversation and we are at the time now where we wanna move on to our next presenter. Um, hope, I'm thinking this is one of the segments that I've been most excited to hear and we're going to hear from some of our students. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, we had a competitive application process early in 2020 when we were planning to have the summer school live in person. And we were, um, and we selected at the time 28 students from those applicants. And they have been working with us in some of the private sessions in the afternoons, um, going through some of the narratives and data analyses in more detail. And so this morning, we've asked some of them to volunteer to share with us the science that they're doing and how the, the work that we've done this week might fit in with that. And so we have a lineup of 14 students. Each of them is going to spend about five minutes uh, introducing themselves real quickly and showing their science. And um, we probably won't have a lot of time for live questions. Uh, you know, we'll see how that goes depending on how long they take. but. Um, definitely encourage you to continue chatting over in Discord and in Zoom webinar um, chat. We can have them respond in there as well. So first one is Amelia Nelson. Please go ahead, Amelia. All right, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name, as you said, is Amelia Nelson, and I'm a PhD student at Colorado State University I'm working with Dr. Mike Wilkins. Um, and really kind of the broad science question of my PhD research is how does wildfire influence the soil microbiome um, and subsequent things like carbon and nitrogen cycling. Um, but more specifically for this project, um, I'm kind of teasing out burn severity as a variable and trying to understand and investigate how different um, wildfire burn severities differentially influence that soil microbial community. Um, and to investigate this question, um, I've sampled across four of these burn severity gradient transects um, located at two wildfires that burned in 2018 along the Colorado-Wyoming border. Um, and you can see we really have soils that kind of span the whole burn severity um, nexus. So we've collected soils from completely unburned, so our control um, type of locations in the forest, um, all the way up to super high severity so that organic matter is completely consumed. Um, and even a year later when this photo was taken, there's really no regeneration of any vegetation there. Um, and to analyze these samples, we first just have basic chemistry data. So things like pH, um, DOC on water extracts, um, and different nitrogen species. Um, I'm also currently working on getting high resolution carbon data. Um, so the good old FTICRMS and NMR that we've talked about this week. Um, and then also on a subset of samples from both low and high severity, um, we've gotten both metagenomic and metatranscriptomic sequencing data. Um, so we really have this big multifaceted data set, um, which I think is really important to try to kind of tease out how the interactions and feedbacks between the biotic and the abiotic components um, shift after this big disturbance in the system. Right. Um, this picture here is just from one of my plots. I believe that was a high severity location. Um, and there's my advisor lurking in the background there. Um, and wildfires will cause basically transformation in um, the carbon and organic substrates that are in your soil system to kind of these aromatic hydrocarbon compounds, um, which is lovingly termed pyrogenic carbon compounds. Um, so one of kind of my more focused questions is how does the shift in kind of the carbon pools in my soil systems influence things um, like microbial heterotrophic respiration, so these lovely little cartoon microbes that are clearly not to scale. Um, and also, of course, microbial assimilation of that carbon into biomass. Um, and I feel like this week I learned two really great tools that I'm very excited to apply to my data set to kind of get at this question. Um, so the first one is the lambda analysis that I believe we learned on Tuesday. Um, and I'm really excited to apply this to my FTICR data set 
to um, gain and this more thermodynamic understanding of how the shift in carbon pools post fire influences things like the bioavailability of the carbon and potential um, carbon fluxes out of the system. Also, um, I'm really interested in doing flux balance analyses um, on metabolic models derived from metagenomic bins that were um, discriminate for either low or high severity um, in our soil system and potentially using the output of this flux balance analysis as a proxy for carbon use efficiency. Um, we talked about that a little bit in my group. Um, and that's a metric that I've been really interested in quantifying for my system um, because I think that really gets at the heart of um, how, how efficiently are these microbes using the organic substrate that's present. Um, and then lastly, as you guys have seen, my data set is kind of this huge multifaceted thing. Um, and of course, one of the challenges always kind of integrating these data sets in, um, to make this cohesive, beautiful story about what's happening in your system. Um, and I feel like I learned a lot of great tools to do so this week. And that's it. Awesome, thank you very much, Amelia, excellent. Uh, so please um, uh, take your questions over to Discord or put them in the Zoom chat for Amelia, she'd be happy to go. And our next speaker is Alexander Elman. Alexander, please go ahead and share. You see that? Yep, everything's great. All right, um, I'm Alexander Allman. I am a PhD student at Washington State University in John Peters lab. And we study nitrogen fixation, um, which is the process of taking dinitrogen out of the atmosphere and reducing it down to ammonia. Um, one big thing about nitrogen fixation is that it's really expensive. So if you can look at the stoichiometry here of nitrogenase, um, this I'm representing with this blue and red enzyme here, it takes 16 ATP and eight low potential electrons used in the form of ferredoxin um, to reduce one mole of N2 to two moles of ammonia. So you can imagine if you're just growing on dinitrogen, it takes a lot of energy to make all your proteins and DNA and everything from ammonia. So I really study what does it cost to fix nitrogen. To fix nitrogen. So um, one big thing as well is that nitrogenase has um, very complicated metal cofactors that are very sensitive to oxygen. Um, so changing in oxygen, changing, changing in carbon supply, and changing in metal availability all affects the cost of nitrogen fixation. One big thing too in our lab is that we are um, trying to develop technologies to help um, supplement crop nitrogen. So Florence Moose, a research professor in our lab, has developed a um, strain of bacteria, as you can kind of just now see in this bar graph, that actually excretes ammonia um, in our flask. And then collaborating with Jean-Michel Ann at University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, we can actually apply that bacteria to rice in this um, figure here. And we know that rice is receiving nitrogen from our bacteria. So what I do is I then take this bacteria and kind of think about the metabolic cost of excreting ammonia to our plants. And I use flux balance analysis to build these models and then I go into the lab and actually test that in bioreactors. Um, so the next kind of step is then using plant exudates um, to use to kind of see what cost of nitrogen fixation is for um, using specific exudates from plants. And kind of why I took this class in um, summer school and what I really want to use to um, what I learned in this summer school. And is how can we actually take this model organism that we manipulate in the lab, we've grown bioreactors, we can model it in bioreactors, how does it actually do things in the soil? Much more complicated. Um, if we look at kind of this graph here from the Moran lab out of PNL, um, using this laser ablation technique, if you like mass spec, just definitely look at this paper, it's really cool, but we can see that there's a lot of complex carbon very close to the root. So how does bacteria, how do we fix nitrogen very close to the root? And I plan on using um, lambda analysis. I think that was very interesting and in how that changes spatially, temporally, um, across the root dynamics, all this kind of things. And then also using metagenomics and metabolomics to see how a engineered bacteria put into the soil will interact with its community and um, how can we maximize nitrogen fixation in the soil, especially in a non-legume system to supplement nitrogen overall.
Great, thank you very much, Alexander. Um, excellent job. And our next up is Stephanie Napieralski from University of Wisconsin. Okay, um, so yes, uh, I'm Stephanie Naparewski and I'm a post in the Department of Civil Environmental Engineering at University of Wisconsin. Um, and I'm working with uh, Eric Roden and Matt Gindervogel. Um, and we are actually collaborating with PNNL to understand the fate of fresh photosynthetically derived particulate organic matter in near surface riverbeds uh, or riverbed sediments, specifically in um, the Hanford 300 area of the Columbia River, which we've heard a lot about um, this week. Uh, so really there's a, there's a very dynamic system. So we're working to understand um, how hydrologic fluxes um, impact the fate and transport of POM um, into or out of the hypheric zone as a function of, of river stage. Um, and so, you know, you can draw like a conceptual model uh, where you have advective transport of this periphyton um, into the near surface sediments. And then, and then what happens, right? You can think of all these different pools of um, POM and then DOM and you have all these microbes, you have hydrologic fluxes, you have, you know, fluctuating redox. So it's a pretty complex system. And so to approach this, um, what we're actually doing is using a three tiered approach um, to analyze the in situ, um, we call them POM traps. And um, I'll link this in the Discord and the, um, the Zoom chat, but there's actually a pretty nice uh, YouTube video that demonstrates what these traps are. Um, but basically to harvest and potentially quantify the rate of POM deposition within the river. And then in collaboration with people at Waterloo, um, we're going to do large, score, large scale column experiments um, to constrain some transport parameters. And at UW, we're gonna be doing some bench scale reactor experiments with, um, I think she might actually be um, in the seminar watching um, my, my student that I'm working with, Eche, uh, we're gonna try to work to constrain some of the kinetic parameters um, in the lab. So, what can I apply from the summer school? This, well, the summer school pipeline, this K-based pipeline was essentially tailored almost exactly to what I want to do uh, because K-based provides a user-friendly tool set um, that will eventually aid in the hopeful development of an omics driven substrate explicit model of POM degradation, which we could then couple to a more macro scale reactive transport model um, in collaboration with all of the great speakers we've had this week. Um, so we could have samples as you imagine from you know, the riverbed, these reactors um, and the cores and analyze them um, by FTICR um, and build reaction networks. And ideally what we wanna do is identify a subset of um, important compounds that we can target for a more quantitative approach that we can then use to build a much more quantitative model um, of these uh, POM degradation. Um, system. So I try to be pretty quick. Um, so I will stop there. Excellent. Yeah, we're, um, we're doing great on time. Thanks, Stephanie. And we're excited to have you and Eric and Matt working with us in the Columbia River Science. That's awesome. Um, next up is Caitlin Remford from University of Colorado. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin Remford. I'm a PhD student at the University of Colorado Boulder. My thesis research has been funded by the Rock Powered Life NASA Astrobiology Institute, which broadly investigates how life can subsist off the chemical reactions between rock and water, including but not limited to the generation of hydrogen from iron bearing minerals. And one collective goal of this group has been to better understand the concept of habitability of rock ecosystems to help inform where we should look for extraterrestrial microbial life on rocky planetary bodies and how we would detect it and go about looking for it. And so my role in this institute has really been to investigate geological and geochemical constraints on microbial dynamics and associated biosignatures in a Mars analog system, which is the Samael Ophiolite in Oman. 
This field site is a terrestrial aquifer, which is hosted within iron-rich prototite in Gabbro Rock. This rock is undergoing active water rock reaction at low temperature, which creates quite a unique geochemical condition. Reacted fluids are incredibly alkaline up to pH 11. They are highly reduced and they're enriched in hydrogen that has been generated through the oxidation of iron in the rock. I've been working mostly to understand how life is distributed in the subsurface environment, what drives microbial dynamics in this unique setting, and what biosignatures could be produced and preserved. To answer these questions, I've been assessing microbial community composition and function using 16S amplicon and shotgun metagenomic sequencing respectively. I personally have been taking more of a read-based approach to mind functional genes of interest, but I have collaborators that have been working with metagenome, assembled genomes, and even doing some single cell sequencing. The bulk of my thesis is actually based in lipidomics. I've been inventorying the intact polar lipid biomarkers produced by the extant microbial communities using HPLC MS on a hybrid quadrupole orbitrap. And the degradation products of lipids can persist in the geologic record for billions of years, um, but lipids in their intact polar state, meaning that their head group is still attached, degrade very rapidly after cell death. So by studying these intact molecules, I can better correlate with other omic data to understand the sources of these lipids. Perhaps most importantly, I studied the distribution and diversity of microbial life and associated biomarkers in this ecosystem within the context of both aqueous geochemistry and mineralogy. And so through this project, we have access to both deep subsurface fluids and rocks through the Mon drilling project. And so there's a ton of metadata to play with. I'm really interested in the abundance and origin of key electron acceptors, such as nitrate, because this is such an oxidant limited ecosystem. And I conduct nitrogen and oxygen isotopic analyses of nitrogen species to investigate this. I'm finishing up my dissertation and I'm planning to graduate this in this December. So I found this course really invigorating because it helped me envision how I can use a lot of the data that I've already collected in my thesis and synthesize it in ways that I previously had not imagined. I mentioned on the previous slide that I've been looking at the isotopic composition of nitrogen species in the aquifer to better understand nitrogen cycling and rock hosted ecosystems. And so with this nitrogen isotopic data, there's a beautiful one-to-one -one trend on between delta 18 O and delta 15 N of nitrate, which is really indicative of nitrate reduction. And I would be really interested to do some reactive transport modeling of nitrogen, which is informed by metabolic models of nitrate cycling organisms to better understand the role of microorganisms in nitrogen cycling and nitrate reduction in the setting. And especially because the nitrate that is sourced from the system is hypothesized to come solely from rainwater, which happens very sporadically when you're in a Middle Eastern desert. I'm also interested in running omics and foreign flux balance analyses to better understand metabolism in this extremely carbon limited environment. You can imagine at pH 11, most of the DIC is in the form of carbonate, which precipitates out as carbonate minerals. And so it's largely unavailable to biology. It'd be a lot of fun to play around with models, optimizing the system to run on really low DIC. And finally, I'm working with an undergraduate who's trying to culture sulfate reducing bacteria from this field site and we're having a lot of trouble. So it'd be great to use some modeling to inform her culturing efforts to be able to get some of these organisms to grow, not just in site water, but in a synthetic medium. As for future, future research, I'm really intrigued by the in introduction of FTACRMS. I use, um, in my lipidomics work, I actually like filter out a lot of isotopic peaks to help simplify my data. But I've been thinking a lot about the power of these minor isotopic peaks, which are much better resolved using FTICRMS. And I would love to look at the molecular isotopic structures of key compounds that are involved in prebiotic chemistry to understand their synthesis pathways. And so I would love to do this type of research as a postdoc after I graduate, and I'm going to start exploring a way to make this happen. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Caitlin. That was amazing. Um, she mentioned that she's looking for postdoc opportunities. So this is a great uh, chance to mention if you want to post your resume and say, this is what I'm looking for. There's a jobs channel over on uh, Discord. So yeah, check that out. Um, next up is Lauren Louie from um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Go ahead, Lauren.
Okay, hi everyone. Uh, Tim, I'm impressed you pronounced my last name correctly. Maybe it, <laughs> most people pronounce it wrong. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm a postdoc at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and my advisor is Adam Arkin. And I'm just starting out with a blank screen because I wanted to focus on um, this really nice graphic that was made for the workshop because it shows different scales. And um, I just wanted, to, <clears throat> excuse me, to talk about how I kind of mostly hang out over here with the DNA and the microbial community scales. And this is a re this is really the reason why I took this workshop is to kind of understand how I could tie in the molecular scale with the ecosystem scale. And so the questions that I'm really concerned with is how microbes interact with each other and the environment. Um, so we understand that, you know, what's in the DNA of the microbes affects how they survive in different conditions and how they interact with other microbes. And so my research, I use both metagenomics and synthetic communities. And that was another thing that I really liked about this workshop is that it really is tying in the computational and the experimental work, which is something that I've been trying to do with my research. And um, so from, for this, what I do is I use metagenomics to kind of survey our samples and try to find correlations. And in particular, I'm focusing on how we can better assemble genomes from metagenomes. Um, and then using that information, can we understand what's going on with microbes in the shallow subsurface? That's the, our, the, my, our field site is at Oak Ridge National Lab and we're trying to understand how the contamination is affecting the microbial communities there. And so also tying in with what we've been learning at this workshop is how microbe-microbe um, interactions are affected by the environment. So I've been mostly doing this in terms of synthetic communities and then manipulating the conditions that they've been living in the lab. But I think the reactive transport models can, um, it'd be really interesting to try to figure out how to tie all these things together. So, for um, the research I'm going to talk about that I'm doing, I'm really focusing on my metagenomics research. So Kelly had this nice analogy of puzzles for metagenomics, and I'm going to take it a little bit further. So, you know, each of these puzzles represent different genes, and then we mix them all together and then say, let's try to assemble these genomes. But it's really actually worse than that. It's like throwing all of the pieces into a blender and then saying, let's assemble them. And the reason why it's like this is because just computationally, you have to break the reads into k-mers. And so you can actually cause misassemblies from this. Um, you just have like pieces of the reads represented into these assembly graphs. And so you might actually end up getting sequence that's not real. Uh, so yes, it's really hard to assemble genomes from uh, metagenomes if you guys have been following along with the K-based narratives. Um, you've seen what's happened with the bins. They're not, some of them are not very complete. So uh, what I've been working on is a semi-automated method to circularize genomes from metagenomics data. And this can really help with some of the things that we're trying to do. So you, when you have a bin, you're like, oh, I know all of the genes. Maybe I can't predict all the functions of those genes, but at least I know all of the genes are there. Um, I don't have contaminating functions from other genomes in there. Um, and then you can also do traditional studies where you're looking at operons and things like that. But also I think for environmental studies, it's really nice because then you can start to link 16S of species that you haven't been able to culture in the lab. And then you could just use this, um, you could do a 16S study and you're like, oh, I know what is probably the gene content in that genome. And then also um, you can have a reference collection so you can better assemble other genomes that you get from your metagenomics. And so the way that this works is, is just, you start, just start off with a um, normal uh, metagenomic assembly. You could use any methods that you want, but what's unique to this is that you, after you do all that, when you have a bin that you want to circularize, you recruit all the reads and then you reassemble with the overlap based assembler. And that reduces misassemblies and actually allows you to extend the contigs until it's circularized. Um, 
this method also, so it, like I said, reduces misassemblies, but since it's extending the context, it also improves bin. So um, even if you can't circularize it, you could imp significantly improve your bin. And I have, so it's posted on BioArchive right now, and here's the code. Um, and I can post these links in the chat. So from the workshop, um, these, so these top two things are the most obvious ones that I could extend my research. I thought learning DRAM and the FBA tools in KBase was really helpful. Um, and, you know, I can use these, like once I have a genome, now I can really try to understand the metabolic capabilities and what that particular genome is doing in my sample. And then I also thought it was intriguing to find um, potential oxytrophies. So, so if I have a complete genome, then I could use the FBA to start thinking about that. And the other thing is I feel much more informed about FTICR data and what we could do with the modeling. Um, and so I can actually design my experiments in the future to incorporate this data uh, more effectively and to get enough sample. Um, things that I'd like to, to think a little bit more about for my future experiments is um, I think it'd be really intriguing to make synthetic communities uh, with isolates from my field site or just enrichments and then pair that with the flux balance analysis to understand how the microbes um, are feeding from each other. And then also uh, just thinking about how to model at the ecosystem level because I haven't been there yet. And uh, so th this is something that at Oak, so at Oak Ridge National Lab, we have all these different wells that we're sampling across the site and it's, it would be interesting to expand what I'm doing to the ecosystem level with this type of thinking. And thank you. I'm happy to answer questions on Discord. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Um, yep, take those questions over to Discord. I see the chat going on there with some of the students already. So thanks very much, Lauren. And next up is Rachel LaCroix from Cornell University. Hi, thank you. I'm uh, Rachel LaCroix. I'm at Cornell University. Um, I'm working with Johannes Lehmann on soil organic carbon persistence dynamics. Uh, so my overall research question is about molecular diversity so of soil organic matter. So the number and richness of carbon compounds in the pool of carbon that we have in the soil. And how does that affect the soil organic carbon mineralization rates um, by microbes? And so our hypothesis is, is that the more diverse that a mixture of carbon uh, gets, the lower your mineralization rates would be. But it's something that we are planning to test. And so furthermore, we'd also like to see how microbial diversity and mineral diversity in soil can either mitigate or exacerbate the effects we see of molecular diversity on mineralization rates. And so the overall approach is not modeling, it's very experimental, of developing a molecular diversity gradient in the lab, uh, measuring that over time with high res resolution mass spectrometry, such as FDS or MS or LCMS, um, and then using that as substrates in other mineralization trials where we use a microbial community, see how they respire that carbon, and then after that we can vary microbial communities and then mineral components and see, you know, how those dynamics change um, in different sort of ecosystems. And so this course has been really interesting because I haven't necessarily gotten to the modeling step of how I would apply it, but I can really see how the, the aspects that we've learned in K-based of the formularity, the FTS RMS processing um, could help me develop these indices of molecular diversity within our samples. And also very interestingly, as other people have noted, the Lambda theory and using that to kind of bin the FTS RMS data to see if there's more thermodynamically or less thermodynamically favorable pools of carbon in our different diversity steps uh, shown here in my little, my diagraphic. You can imagine that maybe thermodynamic favorability decreases as diversity increases. Um, and then potentially also doing flux balance analysis with that. And one of the cool things in the tutorial that we learned was that 
you can look at the biomass built by a cell. And if you kind of combine these metagenomic and FTSRMS data sets, um, which could be very interesting to, to model the system like in silico. Um, and I think before this course, I thought that was way outside my grasp. But now that we've sort of walked through the narratives, I think that this is something that I could incorporate into my research. Um, and so in terms of collaborations, you know, I'm, I'm planning on doing LCMS, but I'd love to do some FTSRMS data as well. And then incorporate uh, meta transcriptomic or metagenomic um, characterizations and see how different genomes get upregulated or downregulated um, across the kind of molecular diversity gradient um, that I've created. Anyway, um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And then additionally, um, some of the aspects that we're looking to vary comes from the soil collection campaign that I did last summer with all of these soils from across the US where um, we'll be able to use some of those soils and microbial communities in this molecular diversity kind of framework. Uh, so that will be really interesting. And I just wanted to wrap up and say thank you for hosting this, um, this workshop for us, even though it went virtual, definitely learned a lot and uh, I'm really interested to continue working with this stuff. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. You're definitely welcome and we're glad you've all joined us. Um, this has been really fun. And I appreciate what you said about, you know, kind of having these things seem out of reach and now maybe being in reach. And that's, that's hopefully what the purpose of the workshop is. So awesome, thank you very much. Um, next up is Brian Rogers from Lawrence Berkeley Lab and Stanford University. And Brian, are you ready to share? Yes, I am ready to share. Awesome, go for it. All right, so as Tim mentioned, I am a research assistant at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, I, working with Michelle Newcomer. I will be starting my PhD this upcoming fall at Stanford with Kate Maher. And at Berkeley Lab, the big question that I am looking at is how do microtopographic features in riparian corridors affect the nitrogen efflux of headwater systems? So I will kind of parse out that question just a little bit. Whenever I say microtopographic features, I'm referring to these small scale depressions you know, within the riparian zone. So these are usually on the scale of a couple of meters. And we are focusing on these features because they have the potential for prolonged surface water inundation. And this introduces sustained anoxic conditions. And then that has implications for the biogeochemical activity, specifically the nitrogen cycling capacity of these features. And we want to look at how these features kind of control the nitrogen budget um, at the scale of meanders and at the scale of watersheds. So I'm using MIN3P to do some reactive transport modeling of these features. And one of the primary uh, uh, components of these models is that they incorporate all of these different hydrologic inputs into riparian hollows. So we have bankful overflow from when the river overtops, there is rainfall inputs, snowmelt inputs, groundwater inputs, uh, there are diurnal fluctuations in evapotranspiration. And what, the, what we want to get from these models is first just to look at the nitrogen cycling capacity of riparian hollows, but then we want to look at how do perturbations to all of these different inputs actually affect the nitrogen cycling capacity of the hollows, and then whenever we scale the impact of the hollows, how do the perturbations affect the nitrogen, uh, overall nitrogen budget of these headwater systems. And there have been several conclusions that have come out of the study, but one of the biggest, uh, what I think is the most interesting is that dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonium, DNRA, plays an important role in the nitrogen mass balance of the system. 
So DNRA is kind of this alternative pathway to denitrification. So denitrification takes nitrate and it converts it to non-react or non-biologically available nitrogen gas. But DNRA actually takes the nitrate and reduces it to ammonium, which is still biologically available. And the fact that this is still biologically available has pretty significant implications on the nitrogen mass balance. And the reason this is significant is because reactive transport models um, don't commonly include DNRA in the reaction network. And that is because the role of DNRA really just isn't quantified very well. So in order to really elucidate the role of DNRA, uh, using some tools that we talked about this week. Um, we can use DRAM to just confirm the presence of genes related to, to DNRA. And we can also evaluate the presence of genes that represent interactions uh, with DNRA and other species such as sulfide. And we can also use flux balance analysis to actually quantify the controls on DNRA kinetics. So we know that carbon to nitrogen ratios affect DNRA, sulfide concentrations, electron acceptor concentrations affect DNRA, but is there a minimum carbon to nitrogen ratio uh, that is needed for DNRA to be present? Or is there a certain carbon to nitrogen ratio where DNRA actually overtakes denitrification and uh, reduces more nitrate than denitrification. Um, these are pretty significant questions because uh, they have potential, potentially very large impacts on just the nitrogen mass balance of really any reactive transport model. So yeah, these tools uh, could really, really help elucidate some of those questions. And that is all I have. Great. Thank you very much, Brian. That was great. Um, and if anybody has questions for Brian, please share them over in Discord or in the Zoom chat. Our next up is Kara Anderson from University of Massachusetts. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Karen Anderson. I'm a graduate student in Marco Kyloite's lab at UMass Amherst. Um, and in my dissertation, I'm addressing how seasonal flooding impacts the vulnerability of soil carbon. Um, and specifically, I'm exploring the biogeochemical links between oxygen limitations, uh, microbial metabolisms, and soil organic matter transformations. And one question in my dissertation that is that links really closely with the, the work um, of the, the microbial modeling school this week um, is asking how seasonal oxygen limitations impose both mineral and metabolic constraints on carbon cycling. Um, so to answer this question, I'm studying uh, really contrasting water years at the East River floodplain in Colorado. It's a high, uh, it's a subalpine floodplain system um, in Colorado. And the figures on the right show some hypothesized uh, carbon losses of dissolved organic carbon and CO2 um, between the flooded and drained periods of the flooding season from, from early June to uh, late September. Um, and to, to test these hypotheses, um, I've performed extensive infield monitoring of soil redox and soil moisture and, so and surface soil CO2 fluxes. Um, and I've also gathered a seasonally resolved data set on both mineral composition, mineral organic associations, and also a multi-omics uh, data set that spanned from that early season flooding to uh, late season drainage. Um, so I'm really excited to use um, some of the tools that we've learned this week um, on this data set. Uh, with the help of um, folks at EMSL, I've collected some metabolite data um, using both GCMS and FTI CRMS data. And these data, these preliminary data show that there are differences in the dominant metabolites that are present between the flooded and drain periods in this floodplain. Uh, and I'm excited to further assess the thermodynamic properties of uh, the soil organic matter during flooding using uh, lambda analysis, for example. I'm also excited to use uh, some of the K-based narratives um, that we've learned this week uh, to make microbial me uh, metabolic networks. 
um, again, preliminary analysis of my data shows that there's a difference in the dominant metabolisms between the flooded and drained periods um, that we see at the East River. And one next step that I'm hoping to take is to integrate some uh, metatranscriptomics or metaproteomics data to assess the active pathways during these periods as well. Um, and in terms of new directions and potential collaborations, I'm excited to uh, maybe collaborate with some folks who are looking um, to model floodplain uh, SOM or solute transformations using tools like the Flowtran. Um, and I'm also really intrigued by uh, the idea of addressing these questions at larger spatial scales. I think the WONDERS framework and some of the work that uh, Michelle Newcomer uh, talked about yesterday, using watersheds as these multi-scale integrators of change, um, have given me some new ideas to scale my questions on the controls of floodplain carbon cycling across uh, different systems and scales. And one way could be working with WONDERS and some existing um, continental scale uh, geochemical data sets uh, to address these questions. So in closing, thanks again to all the instructors this week. You've literally flooded us with a lot of uh, new ideas and tools that uh, I'm really excited to integrate in my research. Thanks. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, we've, uh, we've all felt pretty flooded by the fire hose this week. That's awesome. Um, and thanks for the, for the encouragement to collaborate with Wonders. We'd love to have you engage with us. So, um, let's see. Next up is Patrick Legere, who's from UC Santa Barbara. Patrick, are you ready to go? I'm good to go. And you pronounced my last name correctly. Well done. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. Um, yeah, so I'm Patrick. Um, I'm a PhD student in Michelle O'Malley's lab at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and the, so the systems that we work on, we're really interested in seeing how we can, you know, take lignocellulose, which is this really abundant but really recalcitrant form a biomass and design these microbial consortia to, con to work together and, and play different roles in breaking down the lignocellulose and converting it into things that are useful for biotechnology and bioenergy like fuels and pharmaceuticals. Um, so the systems that nature has designed for this process are these anaerobic consortia that you find uh, within the guts or the rumens of uh, these herbivores that eat grass. Um, so it makes sense that they would have evolved to break down lignocellulose. And we can leverage that by we can take these individual microbes, we can isolate them from the rumen, cultivate them in the lab, um, and then piece them back together in these synthetic consortia and get a better understanding of how they interact and, and what factors may uh, accelerate lignocellulose degradation. Now, however, so the design rules for how you should build these consortia, they haven't been optimized yet. Um, and it's mostly because, I mean, we really don't understand a lot about the metabolism and these anaerobic fungi. So these anaerobic fungi, if you've heard of them, um, they actually produce nature's greatest quantity and variety of the carbohydrate active enzymes. So these biomass degrading casimes we talked a little bit about on Monday. You can see in this figure here, so these are the industrial fungi you've heard of like Saccharomyces and Trichoderma, but these are the anaerobic fungi you see down here. And this is, you know, gene content normalized to genome size. You can just see how much more biomass degradation potential is in the fungi. So it's definitely worth figuring out how they, uh, you know, how they work. We've got a couple of genomes that have been sequenced, but we, we don't have a flux level understanding of their metabolism. And even further, we don't have a flux level understanding of how they interact with, you know, methanogenic archaea, syntrophic bacteria, and how those interactions work in, in space, and also how it really ultimately affects flux in the fungi and breakdown of the lignocellulose. So the approach that I'm taking to this is developing genome scale models to sort of map out this metabolism and see how we can potentially engineer it and manipulate it with cultivation conditions and eventually genetic tools. Um, yeah, so we're really looking for the, these flux distributions. To build these models, it's important that you, you integrate a couple of different types of omics data. So you build the model with the genome, right? But you can constrain it a lot more uh, meaningfully with transcriptomic data, differential expression data, and metabolomic data. And above all, it's super important to validate with fluxomic data if you can get it. Um, and usually I have to talk a lot more about what a genome scale model is, but not with this audience because of this course. Uh, so that's nice. Um, and another thing, as I mentioned briefly, this is a really spatially organized system, not only the interactions between the microbes, but with microbes and biomass, there's a lot of spatial consideration to be taken. 
And that's really what I got the most out of in this course is, you know, I'd read about how people incorporate spatial organization and, and reactive transport PDEs into genome scale models, but I'd never seen the tools and I'd never seen it done. Um, so I really appreciated being able to see all that stuff firsthand. So moving forward, I mean, this is further down the line, but I can definitely envision how, you know, we take the fact we see that these things grow in biofilms and then we can use imaging approaches to see, you know, the relative arrangement of species in the biofilm. And, you know, by coupling DFBA to some of these transport PDEs and reactive transport models, we can maybe eventually even model the exchange of metabolites between species and the environment on a spatial resolution and elucidate some challenges with scale up maybe. Um, so yeah, a collaboration that I think would be super useful um, if, if we can get good fluxomic data for these systems. Um, that here. Yeah, if we can get good fluxomic data for these systems, that would make the models just that much more predictive, um, especially if we can quantify exchange of these sort of difficult to measure metabolites like hydrogen and CO2, uh, CO2 because it's in a bicarb buffer, so it could be hard to see, and really identify this key fungal generate energy generation pathway in the hydrogen zone that has major implications on biomass degradation, but is to date unclear. So I'll leave with this, you know, why model these literally non-model microbes? The way I see it is we compile everything we know as we learn it about these systems, and then the model takes over and points us towards engineering targets. So uh, with that, yeah, thanks for your attention. Appreciate the time to talk about my research and the course in general. Great, thanks, Patrick. Um, yeah, that's really cool. I have not heard of anaerobic fungi, so I'll have to ask um, our EMSL fungi guy about that, Scott Baker. So thanks for sharing that with us. Um, our next speaker is Mariana Garcia from University of Massachusetts. Mariella, are you ready? Yep, uh, I'm just trying to get my computer to, to share the screen. Good. Let me know when you can see it, because my computer is uh, progressively throughout the week, it's been getting slower and slower. <laughs> Starting to come through. We dropped that big virtual machine on you yesterday. That was probably helpful, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I see it in, uh, I see it in, not in presentation mode yet, though. All right. And that looks great. Perfect. All right, cool. Hi, everybody. My name is Mariela. I'm a PhD student at Marco's lab at uh, UMass Amherst. And the question that's been really fueling my research, as Marco has very nicely illustrated, is just what kind of root induced dynamics drive the loss of previously mineral associated carbon? And this question is really fueled from a lot of the master's, master, my master's thesis work that I did with Marco that we published recently in a GCA paper, where we found that at a pedogenic time sequence, um, mineral organic associations, which are that, which form that mineral associated pool that's super important for soil carbon storage is really the formation of this pool is really only seen in zones that are directly root uh, weathered or resogenically weathered. And interestingly enough, the disruption or loss of these mineral organic associations is found, is found to happen also at this, um, at this directly root, root uh, weathered zone or what we would call the rhizosphere. And so what we're seeing here is that roots play a, a two kind of two type of role. They are essential for the formation of this really important carbon soil uh, pool, but they're also the drivers of the loss of this pool, um, which has really fueled like my curiosity about the rhizosphere and the role it plays in uh, carbon dynamics in the soil. And so now a lot of the work that I'm doing as Marco has illustrated is really focus at understanding how when at a smaller time scale, right? Because we just went from pedogenic time scales to now I'm working at um, at a, like a single plant as it's grew, growing and its roots are develop, re, developing and growing into the soil. I'm really trying to understand um, what are the processes, as you can see in this figure, what are the processes that roots drive along with microbes to form, but mostly disrupt some of these mineral organic associations that are essential for carbon storage and soils. Um, that lead to then in CO2 release. And a lot of that has asked that I look at these very micro scale 
uh, reactions at the Rousseau interface that change throughout time as a root matures, as a single root matures, really. And the electrochemistry at the root so soil interface and the moisture at the root soil interface changes. Um, so right now, my approaches encompass the use of, of the use of electrochemistry, electrochemical sen microsensors that we build in the lab, the microdialysis probes that Marco has has talked about. Um, we built riso boxes and we have greenhouse experiments to really get at this question, at these questions. Um, and the other thing we're we're kind of getting into right now with our collaborations with people at PNNL um, is to kind of incorporate some of this into the reactive transport models that Yiling Chang and, and Steve Yamusaki have worked on. Um, so this class, so I want to commend the instructors. I know that it was hard having to turn everything into now what is a virtual session, but I think this is amazing because as as what's happening, as we see what's happening is like these these um, lectures are being released onto on, onto for people to publicly um, access. And I think that's huge. That's amazing because a lot of this stuff, like a lot of like early career scientists, we're just hearing about it, but we don't really know how to use this stuff. We don't really know much about this stuff. And we, we feel like, as Rachel mentioned earlier, that it's out of reach, but these classes really help to make, to, to help us feel like this is something I can touch base on. This is something I can learn about. And I now know point people for who to contact if I have a question about this or if I want to potentially collaborate on, on with this. So for me, I'm mostly coming at the biogeochemistry side of things. And right now with all the techniques that have been discussed throughout the week, um, I feel like I have another side to the coin revealed for me with in terms of a lot of the data that I've been working with. Um, so some of the collaborations we've been working on right now are with Rene Boitier and Rosalie Chu, as they've worked on processing some of our pore water samples to elucidate some of the metabolites in the L with LCMS, but FTICRMS as well. Um, and there, I'm still trying to understand, but I think there's like another layer that we can kind of look at in terms of these pore water samples in the future, um, trying to understand like what are the thermodynamics and what are the constraints or what, are the, what is that diversity of compounds that we're finding in there and what does that tell us about the reactivity at the rhizosphere soil, in the rhizosphere soil. Um, on top of that, the other collaboration as Marco is described is with Steve Ayamusaki and Yiling Feng, um, where we're trying to pair all this data that we've uh, collected um, to their, their, their um, rhizosphere transport model to kind of really look at those iron carbon interactions, which are kind of helping us understand what's, hap what's happening to mineral organic associations at the Russo interface. So I'm, I'm hoping to in the future be able to get a firmer grasp of these techniques first off, but also now that I feel a little more comfortable with this, with, with, um, with these techniques and a little more comfortable just talking about their, their use, I'm hoping to be able to incorporate them more into my work as I go forward to be able to inform me as I'm looking at the data we've collected throughout the years. Throughout the years. Um, and if you want to connect, I've put up my, my email and my, um, my Twitter too, if you guys want to uh, touch base and connect. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Marielle. Thank you for sharing your thoughts about uh, the workshop in that way. And I've been hearing about your work from Steve and Elin as, as they've been working with you. So it's, it's great to hear more about it. Um, our next speaker is Paula Dalson martins and she is joining us from the Netherlands this week. So <laughs> probably one of our farthest away students. Paula, do you, are you ready to share your slides? Oh, yeah. Good. Okay, looks good. Take it away. Thank you. All right, so hello everyone. My name is Paula Dalsi Marchins. I'm a postdoc at Radboud University here in the Netherlands, and you can find me on Twitter. And so my work is a really um, like a collaboration that aims to address this question. How will meth emissions from coastal uh, marine zones change in response to climate change? and eutrophication. So we really are a group of microbiologists and geochemists working uh, together. And in this picture that you see now to your right, 
Uh, that was our last sampling trip to the Stockholm archipelago in Sweden last year. And in this picture, you can see uh, Ritzi, which is also taking the summer school with me. You probably can see he, him <laughs> behind me. And so um, this work is funded by an ERC grant that was awarded to Caroline and Mike. And in this, uh, below you also see Cornelia, who's my advisor and also part of my, this team. And so my part in this project is to identify microorganisms that produce or consume methane in these marine sediment samples via metagenomics and also cultivation approaches, and then quantify their activity of methane production or consumption via a variety of different activity measurements. And then really towards more the end of this project, we would like to build a model that integrates uh, microbial and geochemical data in order to understand methane cycling in this, in, in this coastal zones and predict changes. So this, this summer school was really interesting to me. And some of my favorite things uh, that I'll take with me, definitely DREM. So I'm very excited about having this on KBase. Uh, now, after this week, uh, a wish came for me, so I'm going to talk with the team that probably we should collect metabolomics data and I'll give it a try then on substrate explicit modeling as well as pick axi, which I found really fascinating. And then I would like to try as well lambda theory, metabolic modeling and a flux balance analysis. And in the future, um, as I'm just getting uh, my first hands-on experience with reactive transport modeling. So I'm really excited about all these different approaches that were uh, shown to us in the summer school. And uh, it's really exciting to see the developments in the fields and all the possibilities we have. So I'll have to study that to see how I'm gonna do this. But for collaborations, I might be some contacting some of you <laughs> after uh, this. So thanks for the opportunity of presenting my work and also for putting together the summer school for us. You're welcome and thank you Paula and, and also Itzy for joining us all the way from the Netherlands and staying up late into the night with us as we've worked on these things. So it's been fun having you. Um, our next speaker is Corey Wallace and Corey is from the University of Cincinnati. All right, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Corey Wallace. I am an NSF postdoctoral fellow at University of Cincinnati. Um, and my main science question right now um, involves future um, nitrous oxide emissions along river corridors and how those emissions from subsurface nitrogen cycling will change across spatial scales um, and also in relation to forecasted precipitation associated with climate change, um, expanding agricultural land use, and also sediment heterogeneity, um, which we found to be very important. And so the study site um, for my current project is the Tice Environmental Monitoring and Modeling Site, um, which we call the Thames, uh, located just outside of Cincinnati. And as you can see on my little figure here, um, the site is pretty ext extensively instrumented. Um, so it's at the bottom of the Great Miami Buried Valley water, um, Watershed um, in southwestern Ohio. And so at the site, we have um, three different observation wells. Those give us just general basic water quality parameters. Um, as a part of my current um, NSF funded project, I've installed a series of 23 different redox probes throughout, this, throughout the floodplain. And then we also have, it might be kind of hard to see in the blue here, these um, crosses. Those are ER, ERT arrays, which are electrical resistivity tomography arrays. And those are actually operated um, by Subsurface Insights, who gave us the demonstration on PFLOTRAN yesterday. Um, the site's also one of the sites um, for wonders, and so we've done some sampling over the past couple of years, which has been really cool. And so for my research and for addressing my science question, um, the approaches and the methods I use kind of couple field observations with numerical model development. So from the field side of things, um, the observations include things like groundwater chemistry, or like I mentioned, um, the in-situ measurement of these oxidation reduction dynamics. Um, just as an example of some of this data that we've collected at the site, I have a little video that I'm gonna hit play on here. Um, and what we're seeing here um, on the bottom of this video, that is the redox potential throughout the subsurface. You can see the trees on the top and the brown line is the ground surface. And so and if I hit play, this 
blue on the bottom, that's the water table. And so what we're doing is we're seeing what the redox is doing um, during a flood event, which the river stage or the river level is indicated by that time series just above where the video is playing. Um, and so this kind of analysis has been really cool. Um, and this data really helps us in this sort of understanding of these subsurface geochemical dynamics. You know, it lets us see like as the water table rises as it's doing on the, on the video right now um, and the site floods, we can then see how redox um, distributions and how the redox donation throughout the subsurface changes during these different hot moments that occur um, because we have these really dynamic surface water groundwater interactions. And so taking these sorts of field measurements, um, what I then do is then incorporate them into numerical models. And so, for example, um, on the bottom of the screen here, um, these are some P Flowtran models that I've developed in the past, um, looking at um, some bimodal sediment heterogeneity. Um, we are able to determine, you know, kind of like I mentioned, how we see in our field measurements, sediment heterogeneity really does play a pretty important role in our groundwater um, chemistry and, um, and also just the, the amount of exchange that goes on between surface water and groundwater. And so, you know, taking the field data, um, developing these models, my, my goal is then to incorporate future climate data also and be able to estimate what the amount, um, like what the nitrous oxide emissions from the subsurface look like, um, both across temporal scales into the future and also across spatial scales. And so in terms of um, what I learned from this class, I, I'm really excited to, to apply some of these omics analyses that we learned about. Um, you know, like I said, we have sediment heterogeneity that exists across scales. Um, you know, I'm looking to expand my sort of analysis to using geocellular models to more accurately um, depict what the sediment heterogeneity is. Um, and then using genome scale models to help, help us determine what the subsurface reaction rates are and how they vary with this sort of sediment heterogeneity. Um, and that's kind of more towards producing more of a predictive model and less of a, less of a fitted model to give us kind of a better understanding of what's actually going on. Um, I'm also really excited to potentially use proteomics um, as a way to reveal new pathways that we may not have, you know, initially considered. Um, and so, you know, here on the bottom, this is a PFLOW trend model grid that is currently in development for the TEM site that I talked about on the previous slide. Um, and, you know, once we have this model more developed, what I'd like to do is then use these smaller pore scale models that we talked about this week to help parameterize the larger scale heterogeneity and then hopefully expand that and upscale it to the entire watershed so we can get an idea of what the nitrous oxide production is along this entire river reach. And then in terms of future research, you know, after I've taken all these great techniques that we learned this week and try to apply it to my numerical models, what I'd like to do then is shift the focus from these traditional contaminants like nitrate um, to other emerging contaminants. And our group at UC has actually started some of this work. Um, We've developed a framework that couples um, unstructured grid development with open foam, which is a surface water simulator, um, down into peat flow trend. So we have this kind of um, framework through which we can push these models and really get a good result and a good um, understanding of what's going on. And what I would like to do is then incorporate some of these genomic metabolomic models into that so we can more accurately depict what's going on with the chemistry and the reactions in the subsurface. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Corey. Well, you're really talking my language. I love all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> I'm really happy to see uh, geosim uh, simulations there. That was pretty yep, cool. yep, geosim, you got it. <laughs> I'm also using that. So anyway, thank you very much. And next up is Allison Toon from the University of Texas at Austin. Allison. Okay, so my name is Allison Toon, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm within the Jackson School of Geosciences there, and I'm advised by Daniela Rempe and Phil Bennett. Um, and so very broadly, my research and my dissertation has focused on terrestrial carbon cycling within the critical zone. And when I'm talking about the critical zone, I mean kind of this thin veneer of the Earth's surface that has a lot of dynamic nutrient and um, water cycling in it. And a lot of my research has been built upon observations of um, the fluid phase, seeing it uh, enter the subsurface and precipitation, transit the soil, and then observations that people have made in wells. And 
there's been some discrepancy in that transport and um, uh, fluid alteration. And so um, previously this region of unsaturated weathered bedrock was thought of as kind of this black box. And so um, uh, it's been kind of difficult to study this region because the material properties of unweathered or of this weathered bedrock are difficult to install kind of classic um, monitoring um, uh, capabilities like lysimeters or wells. And so, um, but this region is important if we think of kind of upland systems that um, uh, provide water for a lot of our stream networks. Um, typically, these are characterized by thin soils. Um, with vegetation that is rooted beneath the soil surface. And so there's a lot of possibility for kind of dynamic biogeochemical cycling within this unsaturated but weathered bedrock region. And so in my dissertation, I've kind of focused on three major questions. Is there substantial respiration in unsaturated weathered rock? What are the sources of organic carbon that are important for respiration and driving this respiration within this region? And then also, what are the implications of respiration here for the rest of the critical zone? So does it provide um, uh, like uh, dissolved and organic carbon that then is entering the groundwater system into the stream? Is there a significant flux of carbon dioxide from this region to the surface? Um, and so that's what I've spent a lot of my dissertation focusing on. Um, and to kind of answer these questions, what we've used is a combination of field work with lab analysis, as well as some basic modeling. Um, and what has been very useful is this kind of noveling, novel sampling apparatus that is set up at the Eel River Critical Zone Observatory. So it's, uh, tra it traverses the entire unsaturated weather bedrock regime and allows us to, to sample both gas and fluid um, within this area and has allowed us to kind of take a inside look into these upland systems and see how much carbon cycling and how much production of carbon dioxide is occurring there. Um, and so this summer school has been really useful for me. It's really opened a lot of um, new things to think about as we collect more data at the Eel River Critical Zone Observatory and also in my research as I move forward. And so something that um, I've been really inspired by in the past as this F2 ICRMS data and using it as a tool to understand organic carbon cycling within the unsaturated weathered bedrock. And so this class has really motivated me and provided me with tools to kind of go further with those analyses. Um, it's also given me a lot of context for metagenomic and metabolic modeling. Um, I think that, you know, to kind of key in with these reactive transport models and thinking about reactive transport on a landscape scale, I think it will be useful to have this kind of unsaturated weather bedrock view in the subsurface. Um, and that's also, you know, made me really inspired by this discussion that we've had that both in this class and what we talk about in the greater critical zone kind of community of the path of the water drop and how the fluid phase is altered as it traverses, you know, the entire system from precipitation down to stream water. And so throughout this class, I've really appreciated learning from other students and because I come from more of a aqueous geochemical background. Um, it's been really neat to be able to talk with other students and learn how to talk about metabolomics and talk about metagenomics. Um, also the collaboration tools that we've been learning through KBase, uh, I feel like will be very powerful moving forward with research. Um, and so this whole class has really opened horizons as I think about my next step since I am towards the end of my dissertation. Um, I'll be thinking about postdoctoral opportunities and this has really broadened my view of the different things that I can research. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so I'm really excited about the future. And so I've put my email there too. Yeah. Great, thank you, Allison. Um, yeah, I'd encourage you to go ahead and post in the, in the jobs uh, channel over on Discord if you haven't done that already. And also appreciate the links to the CZOs. This is one of the things I think those of us in the DOE community have been trying to um, build more links to CZO uh, researchers as well. So great to hear about that. Thank you. Our final speaker of this segment is Ryan McLaughlin. And Ryan is from the University of British Columbia, our neighbors just to the north of us here in Washington State. So Ryan, go ahead. All right, let me, OK, 
Okay, can you see that okay? Looks good. All right. So uh, hello everyone, my name is Ryan McLaughlin. Um, I am a bioinformatics uh, PhD student at, uh, in my second year at, the, at UBC in British Columbia. Um, I work with Dr. Stephen Hallam um, in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. Our lab is a micro, microbial ecology and environmental functional genomics focused lab. Um, but my, and my specific area of interest is in the development of computational tools for meta-omics analysis. So no modeling um, to speak of. <laughs> my study system is in the Saanich Inlet, which is, um, which is on the coast of Vancouver Island. Um, it is a seasonally anoxic fjord um, in British Columbia, which observes a decoupling of uh, the nitri nitrogen cycle across both a depth and redox gradient, as well as a distribution of the different um, nitrogen pathways across a diverse, uh, a, a diverse set of microbial lineages. Um, additionally, there is some interesting coupling of the nitrogen cycle as uh, with the sulfur cycle at depth um, that, shifts, that also uh, shifts seasonally. Uh, to better understand these dynamics, my research uh, my current research interest is in the development of a tool for building improved population genomes, also known as MAGs or um, commonly called BINs, um, to provide a more confident and complete metabolic prediction for the microbial populations in this environment. There we go. Oh, it did it again. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. I'll click up here. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> So my science questions are fairly general um, at this point and more focused on really the performance and benchmarking of the tool that I'm building. Um, but I wanted to be sure to mention that I do in fact have biological interest and, uh, and the goal uh, and of the development of my tool is that I can uh, share my tool and be able to uh, allow uh, uh, other, other researchers to um, improve their omics and modeling of microbes in these diver diverse environments. Um, but specifically, I, I hope to assist in the improving, uh, in improving our understanding of the major lineages contributing to the nitrogen cycle, as well as perhaps shedding some light on how, the, how they compete for intermediates, as well as co cooperate to drive the biogeochemical cycles in um, the Saanich Inlet environment. So, I provided a conceptual figure for, uh, for the tool that I'm, uh, I'm currently building. Um, the tool is a type of binner that utilizes single cell amplified genomes or SAGs as a recruitment platform for uh, metagenomic reads. SAGs, which are commonly um, less than 50% complete with respect to their genome, serve as the core of the population genome um, and the reads from the, meta, from the metagenomes are then compared using specific uh, sequence metrics, which uh, then are su subsequently recruited to that and then um, become part of that population genome. Um, so a quick breakdown of my approach. Um, the, I, I'm, the, the tool that I'm building, I'm building in Python, the Python programming language, it leverages uh, several uh, commonly used metrics, which are which are um, also used in binner, in metagenomic binners such as Metabat and Maxbin2, um, namely uh, Kamer signatures, which are which serve as a, a similarity recruitment step for the SAGs and the metagenomes. Then coverage and tetranucleotide frequency um, metrics, which are used for abundance and Kamer frequency recruiting, and then uh, all of those recruitments are then compiled into the population genome. Um, certain stages of my analysis uh, employ a one class classification machine learning approach, which I'm not going to really get into um, specifically here. Um, but if anybody's interested in learning more about that, just uh, feel free to message me. And then lastly, I hope to then apply this method to the Saanich Inlet time series to produce improved population genomes for the microbial lineages that play a key role in the, in the nitrogen and sulfur cycling of that, uh, of that region. Um, so, so firstly, 
uh, what I'd like to say is that I came to this class with absolutely no prior knowledge of modeling um, and have really enjoyed the deep dive into, into modeling. Um, and, uh, and I've come out with many new ideas about how I might incorporate the method, the computational method that, methods that I build um, for my research um, into, into um, modeling, modeling research. Um, and so I'm very excited to brainstorm with some of my lab mates and my collaborators. An excellent application that I can see right off the bat for this is that um, many of the metagenomes that I'm studying in the Saanich Inlet um, have also been um, sampled for biogeochemical uh, rate measurements from our collaborating lab, the Sh uh, Sean Crow's lab here at UBC. And so, um, so I, I've, I've included a, a figure here from a, a, a recent publication from their lab, which uh, looks to explore and model the, um, the breakdown and shift of nitrogen metabolism across multiple important uh, microbial species um, across, the, across seasons. Um, and so in that, in that paper, they, they actually performed flux ballast analysis, but they uh, didn't have metagenomes to work with. They actually only had amplicon data. And so I'm really excited about taking that, the, the, um, the, the rate measurements that they've taken and then possibly employing DRAM and FBA using the full metagenomes that I have to perhaps shed more light on, on the intricacies of the nitrogen, uh, the decoupling and distribution of the nitrogen cycle, as well as the, the coupling of the nitrogen cycle and the sulfur cycle in the Sanch Inlet. Um, additionally, I'd really, be, I'd really be interested to explore uh, applying reactive transport modeling uh, as well, um, but I might have to pick some brains about that because I really, uh, again, I don't really have much ex experience with that. Um, so with respect to new collaborations, um, after I have fully benchmarked my tool, I would really love to find researchers who might have paired SAG and metagenomes for their study sites and would like to try out my tool or maybe work with me and, and, and uh, may, I, could, I could run their data to perhaps uncover um, novel insights about their system by, um, by using these improved population genomes within the modeling. And, and lastly, I'd just like to thank PNNL and EMSL for putting this on because it's been really, really amazing for me. Um, I really didn't know um, to what extent you could combine the, the biogeochemical and the genomics um, information that I work with on a regular basis. And so this is really exciting for me to be able to uh, see this whole new world of, of um, analyses and exploration that I can do with my data. And with that, I'll just say thank you. All right, thank you, Ryan. That was great. And um, thanks to all the students. Those were fantastic presentations all around. And we're pretty much right on time, which is amazing given that we had so many talks there. That was really good. Um, and if you have questions for any of the student presenters, um, definitely encourage you to continue the conversation in the chat over in Discord. Um, I see it's been going on over there. And our next segment before we go to lunch break is we're going to just recap a few of the uh, Department of Energy Biological and Environmental Research facilities and resources that are available to the community. We've been talking a lot this week about KBase, EMSL, JGI, Wonders, all of these sorts of things. And so um, we are Excited to just share, have a few people come and share real briefly about opportunities for how to get engaged with those again. And um, I, I guess, you know, some of the talks, of, well, even Ryan's talk right there at the end was a good example. Um, you know, he mentioned Stephen Hallam, the advisor who's a longtime EMSL collaborator and user. So it's been great to have people engaging with the various facilities and being able to use them. So I think uh, first up in this segment, we're going to have a presentation on uh, JGI, a brief presentation. You've heard uh, a longer presentation on Monday, if you can remember all the way back to Monday. Uh, Reka talked to us about JGI and his capabilities, but we're going to have a brief recap of that by Rex Malmstrom. So Rex, if you want to share your screen or if you're just talking without slides, whatever you're going to do. Uh, I have a couple quick slides. Uh, Great. You can hear me here. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you can think back to Monday when you heard about the 
the JGI uh, is, a, is one of the BRE uh, user facilities. And it's our mission to try to enable large scale multi-omic studies of plants, fungi, algae, microbial communities uh, in order to address questions related to bioenergy and biofuel and other, and just sort of environmental challenges, biogeochemical cycling and things like that. So we have a number of different capabilities and expertise at the JGI that people can tap into. Uh, we obviously we do a lot of sequencing of DNA and RNA, uh, but we also do things like DNA synthesis, where we can synthesize genes and pathways in order to test out their products in the lab. We have a lot of metabolomics capabilities. We mine sequencing databases, and we also have some custom sample preparations. And so the way you access these things uh, is actually through um, a competitive uh, proposal review process. Uh, and this is, uh, I mean, you probably heard about the user facilities already, but it's a little bit different than like a typical funding scenario where you write a proposal and if it's accepted, you get funds. Uh, with the user facilities, if your proposal is accepted, what you get is our, our services and resource access to resources. So, um, and so that's something that if it's accepted, then we do a lot of work uh, for free. The way that people can access these capabilities is through what we call our, our, uh, our user program uh, and the community science program. We have a number of different calls for proposals throughout the year. And so if you want to know more, there's this link up here and this will be sort of your gateway into understanding how to get a proposal into the JGI. But this is one of the pages I just took a screenshot of and you can see that we have these different calls. Each of these rows is a different call and they kind of have at different times. And so we have the large scale CSP call, the ficus, where you can write a single proposal to access both JGI and MSL at the same time instead of writing two separate proposals. Uh, but the one that, that may be of particular interest for folks uh, in this session is what we call the New Investigator Award. We offer it twice each year. And this is uh, uh, really limited to people who've never worked with the JGI before. They've never been a PI on another project. And so it's the idea to have uh, a little bit smaller sort of pilot scale projects to get people in and start getting their getting data. And then, you know, if it really goes well, it can usually then lead to a much larger proposal down the line through one of the other ones. Uh, if you notice here, the submission deadline for the next new investigator one is, is September. So there would be time to certainly uh, learn more about it if you were interested in those capabilities. And up here in this corner, uh, I have Tanya Wakey's uh, email address. She, she runs the uh, user programs for JGI. And so feel free to reach out to her or anyone else you actually have. If you know anyone at JGI, you can reach out to us and we'll, we'll get you the answers as best we can. Uh, I was just going to highlight, uh, just because of the nature of the course that you're doing, two of the capabilities in the world of, of microbes that you might actually be interested in that are a little bit unusual. And they're focused on studying microbes, the you know, functional work of microbes, rather than just sort of a strict, you know, metagenome and sequencing and get in the metagenome, you can actually incorporate these uh, methods with experiments. So one of them we call BOMCAT facts, which is a method for selectively uh, sorting, recovering and sequencing microbes that were metabolically active in your incubation. And really briefly, the way this goes is you're, you're, you incubate your cells along with this uh, modified amino acid called HPG. It gets incorporated into newly synthesized proteins. And because of a, a little side chain on the, HP, on the HPG, we can then click on a, a fluorescent molecule, which will light the cells up if they've been synthesizing protein. And then we can put them on the flow sorter and sort just those cells. That can be done for single cell genomics or a targeted metagenomics type study. So anyway, this is kind of a cool technique that you can use, uh, especially if you're dealing with systems where you think that have reason to believe that many or most of the cells might not really be active at, at any one particular time. Or if you have experiments where you think you can make an amendment and that might, you might be starting from very few cells that are active and really turn a whole bunch on or vice versa, where you do something where they're mostly active and you hit them and you want to see who can keep surviving that. So anyway, that's one of the versions of, of, of flow sorting cells based on activity. Uh, another method we have is stable isotope probing. It's kind of been around for, for a little while. Uh, the idea of meaning you incubate your cells with uh, the isotope, isotopically little compounds, and that isotope eventually ends up in the DNA or RNA of those microbes. And then 
can be separated based on a density centrifugation to separate the labeled and unlabeled uh, nucleic acids, at which point you can do sequencing and identify who are the cells, you know, get the genomic information of the cells that were actually consuming that compound. Anyway, that's a, it's been around for a little while, but it's a real pain in the neck to do, especially at the scale you'd want to. And we actually have automated ways of doing that. So it can be a useful resource for those who want to do SIP, uh, but just you know having trouble getting over that last, the hurdle uh, to do it at the scale they want. Okay, that was a quick overview. Uh, a lot of genome sequencing, again, genome sequencing, metabolomics, DNA synthesis, some custom preps. If you want to know the latest about the JGI, you can follow us on all the different social media channels. Uh, and then we also have these two cool podcasts that have been out right now. You might want to check them out. Here's a, here's a short little uh, link up here that's highlighted if you want to listen to something while you're walking the dog in the morning or on your commute. Okay, that's it for me. Great. Thank you very much, Rex. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll give a plug for the podcast, the Genome Insider podcast. There's one on Kelly Wrighton's group in there that's really great. That's a good one. <laughs> so, yeah, um, great. Thank you very much. And next up, we're going to hear a little bit about Ideas Project from Xingyan Chen. Xingyan is my co-PI on the SFA project at PNNL, and she is also the PNL co-PI on the Ideas Project. You've heard a little bit about Ideas, and I wanted to give her a chance to tell you a little more about what it is and how it might be beneficial to you as a community member. So, Xingyan, if you have a, you have a couple minutes uh, on a slide for ideas okay so uh let me share like one slide um perfect um let's see where is my screen so you will probably see that again in like my uh, uh, other talk uh, after lunch uh, but i can uh, explain more about ideas right now uh, so I can save my time. Um, let me present it. And it, it, does it come up? I'm not seeing anything. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Okay, this should be. There we go. Now I'm seeing it. Okay. So yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, so at this uh, ideas, uh, re it's a short name, represent the uh, interoperable um, design of software ecosystem. And uh, this project focuses on building such software ecosystems for watershed sciences. And you have he heard a lot about like biogeochemistry and how the microbial processes and uh, all those genomic informations are impacting those biogeochemical processes. So uh, as we, uh, I, I don't know how much uh, watershed models you have run um, uh, so far, but a lot of times we start with uh, hydrology in watch, uh, watershed hydrology models, uh, watershed models. And then we add like uh, biogeochemistry and other processes like uh, land surface fluxes, evapotranspiration and all of this to, to our models. And in the past, the community has developed like a lot of different codes, as you can see all those names over here, including OpenFORM, including PFlowTrain and uh, Wolf Hydro, CRM, SWOT, and all these different names. Um, and those models are usually designed to represent certain processes uh, for uh, the problems that are driven the develop development of these. And currently not a single code can do like all the processes we're interested in linking what shared hydrology with the biogeochemistry and make them fully coupled uh, with all the components uh, in the watershed coming into play. So what ideas watershed is trying to do is uh, building like the uh, uh, common libraries underneath all those codes. Uh, in that way, we are trying to make like different modules within like a code, mo uh, like sharing those libraries so that they can be like plug and play uh, ideally, but uh, it's like, like very difficult to uh, make that uh, 
just like it doesn't happen just like a magic but we need to like build like interfaces to make different modules talk to each other so uh with that like common library makes such uh like integration or building the interface between different codes and the processes much easier um and this is like an effort we cannot do without the community involvement. So what we're doing is like we collaborate a lot of developers of all these codes uh, from like uh, different universities, different uh, like uh, national labs. And then we design the system uh, to make the interface like as, as uh, agnostic as possible to talk with a lot of different uh, models that do the same similar things and we also will have like say uh, a lot of activities designed to compare the model performances uh, with different configurations use the same set of the codes or use use like different codes as well and uh, we run simulations we compare the simulations with models uh, simulations with data uh, all this are integrated to help us build like more accurate uh, predict models for predicting what is happening within the watershed and how that is impacting, say, the what quality and the quantity uh, that impact our daily life. So with that, uh, I, I, I can take questions if anyone has. Thank you, Xingyan. I think we'll um, we'll ask people to take the questions over in the Discord or in the Zoom chat. Okay. And, um, I appreciate that. And please uh, come back for Xingyan's presentation. She'll be the first presenter this afternoon after the lunch break. Um, our next person up is going to be Charu Varadrajan from Berkeley Lab, and she is going to talk a little bit about ESS Dive. So we've been working this week with Wonders Data, which, as you know, we downloaded from ESS Dive. And so Charu is going to join us for a few minutes and talk a little bit about that system. Thanks. Hi, thanks for joining us, Charu. Thank you, Tim. Um, so I, I'm really glad um, everyone's gotten a chance to work on ESS Dive. I'm Charu Vardarajan, and I'm one of the co-PIs for ESS Dive. Um, and, and sort of just to step back a little bit and, and tell everyone about what ESS Dive itself is, it's the data repository for this uh, DOE-sponsored program for terrestrial and subsurface, subsurface ecosystem research. So that's called the Environmental System Science Program. And what we store here is a very, very diverse data, everything from genomics, but also, you know, sort of mineralogy, geochemistry, hydrology, so, as well as remote sensing and modeling. So I'll take you through a quick tour of our data portal, but just want to say that this is sort of a very diverse data repository. So you can find not only the genomics data out there, but also sort of related ancillary data that you may want for your analysis. Um, so I wanted to quickly actually just show our website because um, I think for someone who's trying to use ESS Dive, this is probably one of the best places for you to go to for our resources. So I want to point out that a couple tabs here, one is for users where uh, we have a lot of guidelines for things like how, you know, if you wanted to store with ESS Dive and you're, you're putting in a proposal to DOE, how you would go about doing that, but also citation guidelines when you're using data from ESS Dive and how you would contribute data. Uh, we also have extensive support uh, and a help documentation as well as video tutorials for, for some of you want to get a bit more in-depth deep dive into some of the features that we're offering. So the data portal here would take you to our main data portal here and so uh, I gather you've already had enough uh, experience playing around and downloading this but if you just do a, a quick search on metagenomics I want to point out that there's a lot of very diverse data here that you can start to download, not just from Wanders, but many other DOE projects that are collecting related uh, data sets. So I'm going to, since you've played around with Wanders, I want to click on something else that they'll show you a little bit about what it has. And also you can see sort of the spatial view. You can do lots of other filters in here. Um, and I think that some of the, the, the aspects of, you know, you can find the citation, copy it, put it in your manuscript. You can see how many downloads or views there are. 
Um, and and when you when these data get cited, they will be the citations will start to show up in their citation count. Um, and and we have lots of information that provides you context for what these are. So anything that's mentioned in here is actually searchable. So if you search, for instance, here it's for JGI, you're going to be able to find this data set through our main search portal. Um, and then you can, of course, download it and get other information about where this data is. So uh, I won't go too much into the details of, about uh, how you do this since you've already been done, uh, done with it. I also want to mention something that's not available through our website is some support we have for more of the data contributor side of things. We're actually right now working on some community projects here for developing data standards for a number of different data types. And these are being done by several of the national lab partners that we have, including some people from the Wanderers team that you can see here. And what this is, is when these are still in the process of being developed right now, but when these are complete, uh, these will help ensure that the data within ESS guide are standardized. So when you download the data, you can start to write automated scripts that pull some of the information out. Um, so this is still work in progress, but we've, we've really made enough strides that we think within the next few months, we're going to have um, sufficient data standards out there for samples as well as for soil respiration, hydrology, and get at least physiology. So, uh, and we also are providing support for the international geosample numbers, IGSNs, and working with MSIL, NMDC, and KBase and coordinating um, some of these standards across our facilities. So that's really what I have to say, um, and happy to take questions at the end. Okay, great. Thanks, Toru. Thanks very much for joining us. If anybody has questions for Charu, please drop them in the Zoom chat and um, or over on Discord. And um, our, let's see, I think uh, Amy and James, are you guys on? Uh, I'm here. James is here. James, did you want to say anything about wonders in this segment? I didn't know if you were prepared to show a slide or not. Um, um, so I do not have a slide prepared. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, there, I mean, so Amy gave her presentation on, on Monday. Um, I guess I'll just say uh, that I think as most people heard, you know, Wonders really is is built for and is enabled by the community. Um, it's not for PNL scientists or anything of that nature. It's really meant to um, to advance with the community and by the community. Um, I think, as, as Amy mentioned, you know, our sampling campaigns are very much informed by the needs of the community. Uh, we do modify the things we're measuring, how we're taking samples based off the community needs. So we're always looking for uh, input in, um, uh, in terms of uh, where, the, where the community wants to go. Uh, we encourage you to reach out to us if you have thoughts along, the, uh, along those lines. Um, you can get added to our newsletter distribution uh, to keep up, kind of keep up with, with uh, what's going on. Always very happy to receive uh, emails from anybody wanting to provide suggestions, criticisms, whatever they may be. Uh, you can email us at uh, wonders at pnl.gov. I think that email has been shared. Uh, maybe it can be put into, or maybe I can put it into the chat if people don't have it yet. Um, and there's lots of ways to be involved in wonders. That's, I guess, maybe one of the, the key things here is, you know, we send out kits to people uh, to collect samples, and you know, so they come back here and data are provided. Um, and so, you know, you can be involved as someone that wants to go in the field and uh, collect a sample that may be um, useful to you uh, to learn something more about your own particular field system. Uh, you might be able to use the, the associated data to write a manuscript or write a proposal or both. Very much encourage people to do that. Um, take wonders, use it, leverage it towards your needs, towards your goals. Uh, that's quite important. I really want to encourage people to do that. Um, but in addition, even if you're, maybe you're not a field person, that's totally possible. Um, you know, there's, we're really looking for people uh, that want to use the data in ways that are, that are interesting to them, to ask uh, questions that are interesting to them. Uh, we're, and we're, we're trying to move towards um, a publishing model, uh, really a way of doing science, not just publishing, but a way of doing science in which we're doing it more as a community. So I think people are familiar with the standard way of doing science where you know there's an individual investigator they go get their data they write a paper maybe with you know a few colleagues uh, publish that paper 
uh, increasingly those data then are made available. That's great. What we're trying to do with Wonders is make the data available ahead of time uh, before manuscripts are written. And what we want to start to do is to pitch ideas uh, to the community of say, hey, you know, we have this idea of a science question. Uh, there's some data here uh, that we think would be useful to answering this question. Uh, maybe do this by social media um, and start to get feedback on that question, the, the data, the relevance of the two to put together, and then actually pursue the analyses as a collective in an open way where the community is actually contributing analyses, not just feedback, but actually doing hands-on work with the data. Uh, Community-based interpretation of the associated results in an open, fully open, transparent way. Whoever wants to get engaged is, is welcome to do that writing the manuscript as a community together. So it's not a single investigator doing this, you know, in isolation, kind of doing their thing, but it's a community together doing it. Um, so our colleague, Emily Graham, recently did something very much like this in more of a conceptual way with uh, disturbance, uh, uh, disturbance ecology. Um, maybe some of you are involved in that manuscript. I think it's in review right now where it was, uh, she calls it her Twitter paper, where she had an idea of, of thinking about a new way of conceptualizing disturbances. She reached out to the community by social media, had people from all over the world contributing to that manuscript in an open, collaborative way. And so we want to take that to the next level of analysis and, and, and interpretation of those analyses uh, together. So if that sounds interesting uh, to anybody or who wants to kind of help develop even that concept of a way of doing science, uh, please reach out to us. You know, you can ping us on Twitter, email us, whatever it may be. Uh, but we really, the more people get engaged, the more powerful it will become and the more it will help advance us collectively. So I think I'll just leave it at that um, and look forward to uh, talking to more of you. Thanks, James. Great. Um, so uh, our final presenter in this segment is going to be Nancy Hess, who's going to talk about, about the host uh, facility, EMSL. Um, I also wanted to mention before, as Nancy, if you want to start sharing your screen or getting ready, um, of course, KBase has been a huge component of this whole uh, summer school. And KBase is a very important resource to the DOE and the uh, broader research community. Um, I just wanted to point out to those who may not have seen the message uh, Elisha, Alicia uh, posted on Discord this morning. Um, she noted that she had opened up the the, the special group for the summer school um, to the public as of today. So if you want to access those narratives and all of the material that was used by the students in the in the private sessions, those are available. And I'll post the KBase website into the Zoom chat for you shortly. So Nancy, thank you. Is it is it showing presentation mode or showing Not, correctly? No okay. Okay. Yeah, so um, thanks. Thanks, uh, everyone. And thanks, Tim. So um, I started off with this slide on Monday. Um, but just to re reorient you, we're located here in eastern Washington. Um, we're run by the Department of Energy Office of Science in the Biological and um, Environmental Research Program. EMSL has like 150 kind of really unique instruments and about 200 uh, scientists uh, that do work in the environmental and biological science areas. We really embrace this integrative experimental modeling and computational approaches to um, solve scientific challenges in that uh, molecular and up to ecosystem scale. And we have, you know, users from all over the world. And we have a pretty neat website. You can uh, check it out there. Just wanted to talk a little bit more about the type of science that we do. We have a science area called uh, functional systems biology. And we're here, we're really trying to explore the prediction and control of biology for sustainable energy. That's taking the information that's encoded in DNA, understanding what is actually expressed in terms of the different biomolecules understanding how those biomolecules interact in metabolic pathways, to do things like store lipids in, in yeast cells, uh, Yarrowia shown here, or how that's expressed in the different um, plant phenotypes in terms of uh, bio, bioenergy systems. Um, we're also very interested in understanding these processes and turning, turning, uh, generating exoenzymes that are responsible for the degradation of biomass and understanding how to optimize those processes. 
On the environmental side, we saw a lot of uh, talks in this area and, and some great application areas this morning about understanding the interaction with, of microbes in the soils, how they interact with the rhizosphere and root exudates and how that can change the um, soil chemistry and mineralogy and how that can lead to um, the, the buildup and, and cycling of carbon and other micronutrients in soils. But we're also interested in this amazing connectome between plants and microbes in the subsurface and how that um, their signaling and exchange of nutrients and that the, and tapping into this, this total information network that goes on there. And also the above ground point, we can observe from space uh, the impacts of water uh, limitation and drought long, long before there's uh, uh, effects in terms of trees dying. We can see phosphorus limitation in the rainforest using these same mechanisms. So essentially we're trying to decipher these molecular signaling pathways to really understand um, and predict the ecosystem response to perturbation. And so in EMSL, we, we, we have these two areas uh, that we uh, solicit calls for proposals in them, and we support our research by using these integrated research platforms that are called out here. And so the 150 instruments that I talked about earlier are actually assembled into research platforms to do functional omics, to look at bioimaging on, the, on a molecular basis. Where are molecules located in cells? What is their transit across uh, cell membranes? Understanding cellular dynamics, uh, the accumulation of lipids in, in uh, uh, exoenzyme uh, pockets and things like that. We're in more in the environmental area. We're looking at those biogeochemical transformations in soils. We have instrument platforms to look at the flux of nutrients and micronutrients using isotopes and different chemical um, analysis platforms. And we have a molecular phenotyping um, platform where we have uh, specialized plant growth chambers where we can add uh, C13, we can measure uh, photosynthetic efficiency, we have rhizoboxes and, and different methods for extracting out um, pore fluids. And uh, one important part of this that really was highlighted in the school was this computation analytics and modeling platform that really wraps all these experimental uh, uh, platforms together. Um, uh, we do have a pretty uh, swift and we're actually upgrading our supercomputer um, as we speak. Um, and we're really interested in leveraging that computational strength behind some of our analytical uh, capabilities. So um, to collaborate with EMSL, we have a couple of proposal opportunities. We have a, similar to JGI, we have a large scale research call uh, that comes out in the winter and that's about a two year program. We have the joint call with uh, JGI, the FICUS uh, research program. Uh, we've also expanded that recently in a pilot with NSLS2, as well as NSF's uh, National Ecological Observatory Network, NEON. So those are opportunities where you can access resources at multiple user facilities and, and uh, to conduct research. We have an exploratory research program that is uh, year long in dur duration. That call should be coming out actually just in a few days. So um, be sure to look for it on our website. And we also have this limited scope uh, option, which is a great way to do a um, proof of principle. You just wanna see how something works and uh, you can send us samples, we can work with you. Uh, to see if you're going to get the type of uh, analytical result that will uh, move your science forward. We're also really interested in, in developing a more sustained research, research uh, relationship. Um, if you want to develop unique capabilities in uh, your science and partner with us to co-develop things, we have a scientific partner proposal. Uh, uh, aspect. So go to our website. Um, you can um, learn more about these calls in the for user um, area and it talks more about these call opportunities. Uh, here's just a snapshot of um, our annual and special calls. And then I wanted to just end here by mentioning that we have our annual user meeting coming up 
and uh, in October, and it's going to be visualizing the proteome. We've gotten some really nifty new uh, cryo EM microscopes and our uh, high resolution mass spectrometry capabilities to understand um, the structure and function of proteins and where they're located within cells. And this will also be a virtual um, uh, workshop. And so with that, um, I think I'd be happy to respond to any questions that you have over on Discord. Um, so. Thank you very much, Nancy, and thanks again to all the speakers in this segment. Um, we've covered a lot of ground this morning already, and uh, hopefully this has all been helpful and useful to you. Um, there's some information being posted in the Zoom chat about various links and how to connect with the facilities you've just heard about, um, and some more information over on the Discord uh, site, as well as information in the Google Doc that's been shared this week with, for, for other links. So definitely encourage you to contact people from these resources, work with us. Uh, one of the questions that came up over in Discord was about, you know, is it possible to work with EMSL scientists before you submit a proposal? And, and definitely the answer is yes, we encourage that strongly. So if you're interested in an idea, contact us. We can help you figure out which instruments might be useful or um, what, you know, how, even help you design your experiments um, and, and prepare your samples. So um, we're a little bit over on our time and we're running into our lunch break. So I'm going to let you all go for lunch. Um, I believe we're going to keep this Zoom channel open during the break. Is that correct, uh, Sarah? Sorry, could you say that one more time, Tim? Um, I think we're keeping the Zoom channel open during the break, but we will be taking a break until 1230. Is that correct? Yep, that sounds fine. Yep, I will keep this open. Okay, so we'll have the Zoom channel open. You don't have to leave, um, uh, but um, we will be signing off for a little bit and everybody will have a chance to grab some food or whatever else you need to do. Um, have a couple great talks coming up in the afternoon, uh, a couple more application talks. And so just uh, encourage you to join us again in about 25 minutes here on this same Zoom channel. And in the meantime, if you want to pop on over to uh, Discord and chat with your colleagues, uh, there'll be a lot of things going on over there as well. So thanks again to everybody for this morning and we'll see you back here soon. And our first speaker of the afternoon is going to be Xingyan Chen. Um, and uh, she's going to speak about omics informed reactive transport modeling in watershed systems. So uh, I think we're maybe a minute early, but I don't know, 1229. I think you can go ahead and start, Xingyan. Or like I can wait for another minute uh, to take a breath and checking if you can see my mouse if I move it around. Yes, I can see your mouse if you move it around. Okay, and that's nice. Everything looks good and uh, my clock says 12.30, so let's go. Okay, thank you, Tim. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And my name is Xinyuan Chen. I am a research scientist uh, here at the PNNL. I uh, you know my, my daily work is uh, simulating the uh, uh, hy hydrologic and biogeochemical processes across uh, watershed systems. And I also, do a lot of the model data integration uh, that we apply like statistical methods, uh, including machine learning to uh, improve our predict models. So um, the, the, the presentation I'll give, I will give you some uh, examples of what we do with this omics data to uh, simulate and quantify the cumulative uh, effects of uh, uh, like denitrification or respiration in the river. And it involves like work from a big group of colleagues we work over here. So um, I would like to start uh, acknowledging the contributions from all of them, uh, including Tim, uh, who has been uh, the, uh, in, uh, the organizer for your great summer school. And uh, also like a lot of results come from the project he is leading uh, with a lot of the uh, scientists over here. So uh, it, it was really nice to hear the flash talks from all, all of you this morning. And uh, you, you might see how your work might plug in to this kind of a, like bigger scale uh, hydrobiogeochemical studies. 
Um, let's see. I might have clicked it two, uh, two more times, but so when we talk about what shared function, uh, we're talking about the complex um, hydrologic and biogeochemical processes happening within a watershed. Uh, and it's impacted from processes happening at molecule scale all the way to a watershed or basin scales. Uh, for our study, we especially focus on a narrow band around the river, which we call river corridor. Um, within that system, the characteristics uh, is being the hydrologic exchange flows. Um, we define that as the bi-directional -direc exchange between the river water body and the uh, uh, surrounding uh, environment around it. And then what this exchange flow does is it changes the, uh, um, the, the thermal regimes of this uh, interface and brings different water bodies together that uh, creates mixing between different uh, water chemistry and also uh, stimulate the micro microbial functions within that. So this kind of a hydrologic exchange plays a very important role in controlling the uh, transformations of key nutrients and contaminants uh, in this uh, river corridor uh, system we're going to focus on for the rest of this, uh, this talk. And um, there are like significant knowledge gaps uh, in understanding this complex system. So you can see uh, this uh, upright over here is a real system at the Columbia River Basin we are in here. And this is how we conceptualize the system uh, based on our understanding. It's like who are in the system, what they do, how they interact with each other, and how do the external drivers like uh, extreme precipitation or fire impacted how everyone in the system is functioning. So a big challenge is for us to understand and also quantify processes governing um, the uh, cumulative effects of the biogeochemical processes controlled by the HEFs, the organic chemistry, microbial activity, and disturbances. To take, to deal with that grand challenge, we need a key over here is to translate the understanding at smaller scales all the way across different uh, scales to the basin uh, to the watershed or the basin we're interested in quantifying the cumulative effects of biogeochemical processes and you have learned a lot of the uh, um, like theory and the tools uh, that can help us to understand what's happening at the molecular and a you know column scale to figure out what what reactions happen, how fast they happen. And then with that, we can scale up to uh, quantify what we might predict at the basin scale. With that kind of a, a knowledge in place, we can answer questions like what watershed uh, characteristics control the spatial and temporal variations in river corridor biogeochemistry. And with the disturbances like wildfires, how do the river corridors mediate the watershed responses in both quantity and quality to wildfires and precipi precipitation events. Um, to deal with uh, this like very complex problems, um, uh, 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 we usually start with uh, the hydrology first before we couple hydrology with biogeochemistry so we can understand uh, the, what's the driver of the biogeochemical functions of our system. Um, to give you an example of a, 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 a watershed scale hydrologic simulations we have performed, this is a, um, actually we are about over here. And this is a, um, like a regular, like regular size watershed we uh, carved out uh, from the, uh, um, uh, from the bigger aerial image of the uh, um, uh, Columbia River Basin. And our model domain is uh, 60 kilometers uh, wide and long, 200 meters uh, deep. And we use the P-flow chain to simulate how do this like heterogeneous hy hydrogeology 
combined with river uh, geomorphology uh, with the uh, fluctuations of river stage stages in this uh, different places along the river which is like uh, regulated by a dam upstream from our domain and how do they all like work together to control uh, to determine how much exchanges is uh, uh, occurring between the river and the groundwater aquifer system and how do they vary uh, in time as well so we use the p flow trend to do that and uh, more details of this model can be uh, found in a recent paper uh, Ping Shui uh, published. And um, for this model, we discretize this whole domain into grids of a size of 100 meter by 100 meter horizontally and two meter vertically. In total, we had about 36 million cells. And we are applying uniform um, property for each material, like each color means uh, one, same hydraulic conductivity and uh, we applied like no boundary conditions uh, across the lateral and at the bottom and the river stage is taken uh, is like a varying uh, as shown in this uh, figure we took that from another river routing model that gave us a uh, uh, very accurate um, prediction of uh, the the spatial temporal dynamics of river stages along uh, this uh, this region and we are simulating the whole system in like six hour um, time step uh, in maximum. And then this is like what we see from our model. So we, uh, on this animation, we're only showing the exchange of fluxes between the river and the groundwater. So it's a flux across the riverbed. The red colors mean um, the uh, water is going from the aquifer to the river, so river is gaining and negative means the opposite. Um, it is like very obvious uh, from this animation that there are certain regions, um, you see like more exchanges than the other regions. And also this, this kind of heterogeneity, they change when the river stage goes up and down in time. Um, then, we, uh, then we need to know, it's like, uh, what does this kind of exchange uh, mean to where the mixing happens. So what we did was to apply numerical tracers in the river and we, we track where they go in time and visualize uh, in this animation, you know, similar to the uh, uh, exchange flux animation. The redder color means more river water in the uh, groundwater system or in the river. And the blue one is more dominate, dominated by the groundwater. So you can see over time, you can see those hot spots of exchanges that that's indicated by like the uh, presence of more river water in that place. And you can also see how this uh, zones of influence change over time driven by the river stage uh, uh, regulated by the dam upstream. And you can also see the heterogeneity is playing a very significant role in controlling where the river prefers to go. And um, for example, like across the, uh, meand the big meander over here, there's also a preferential flow path uh, of exchange that is, uh, um, that is promoted by a paleo channel we have identified from like um, geological um, records from all those wells that have been uh, drilled in this uh, uh, system. So if we zoom into like uh, this region for more details, you can, uh, you can also see how this exchanges and mixing are changing the temperature uh, field of the, at the riverbed. So the warmer color means um, warm, warm temp, uh, higher temperature and red ones are uh, colder ones. Um, you might notice that groundwater temperature seems to be pretty stable uh, because what, that's what we observed from our monitoring network. And that's also how we conceptualize our model in boundary condition to make uh, groundwater like uh, pretty, uh, groundwater temperature pretty stable over time. And then you can also see how the uh, fluctuations in river temperature is actually 
also captured by our uh, model uh, that is strongly related to the exchanges uh, that we have captured uh, in, in the numerical model as well. And um, the temperature simulation is very important for biogeochemical reactions because they change the rates uh, of all those reactions. And the next question is like, how do we then simulate the biogeochemical processes in the, in the system? And the first thing we need is like, we need to know what reactions and how fast they, they, they occur. So we need to put in a reaction network with the kinetics. And um, we have also learned to capture such like reactions. We need to, we need to uh, do very fine scale hydro, biogeochemical and thermal uh, simulation. So you can imagine we cannot do uh, that uh, do that with a uh, 100 meter by 100 meter and two meter um, resolution as we have done for the uh, hydrologic exchange flow um, because not everywhere is reactive. So what we did was to first see how the uh, biogeochemical hot spots and hot moments um, look like within a refined domain with very high resolution. So we pick like almost a grid size from our rich scale model. I mean, this domain uh, we study in detail is about the size of a grid cell in our watershed scale model we just presented. And then we uh, took a 2D cross section uh, which incorporated all this like fine detail heterogeneity in our geological layers, uh, which are like uh, mainly composed of, of three types. One is the, uh, we call it like, uh, alluvial layer. That is the more recent deposit uh, uh, at our riverbed, which is the most reactive layer of our system as well. And um, then we also like beneath that, we have a very high permeable Hanford formation, uh, which are having like a hydraulic conductivity in the range of like thousands of meters per day. Uh, and these two layers are underlain by a ring gold formation, which is used as uh, like our confining layer. And we like for this model, our resolution in the riverbed is about like 0.1 meter uh, vertically and horizontally. Um, and at the same time, we also drive the uh, boundary condition, like the hydrologic boundary condition on both ends using fluctuating river, uh, like river stages and groundwater level we obtained from our observation. And uh, now what's, what we have seen from that model is uh, this. Uh, sorry, it's a very busy uh, animation. But what we're showing over here is uh, on the left, we're showing the concentration of all the species we incorporated into our model. On the right, we're showing uh, like the reaction rate. That means it's uh, either production or consumption of that species um, at that time and over space. So uh, the, this like uh, jumping line indicates where the river table uh, was at a given time point. So although it's a very busy, but sometimes we like to see this because it gives us uh, the, uh, uh, not only the spatial heterogeneity, but also the dynamics of uh, the concentration and also what's uh, hap reaction, uh, like the reaction hot spots um, very uh, intuitively. And we can see how different species are responding to the uh, river fluctuation differently as well. Um, and so this level of high resolution simulation is really critical for capturing the heterogeneity of the uh, reactions within our system. And as we know, we will not be able to do this level of a simulation across a watershed, even if we only focus on the river corridor. So what we do, um, do you see a blue screen right now? Not yet, I'm seeing your, oh, now I see it. Okay, um, I think something happened on my end. 
Yeah, it looks like it crashed. Yeah, uh, let me restart sharing. Maybe my uh, movie was like too busy and uh, the computer doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Sorry about it. Um, how is it? Um, pretty good. It's cutting off. There it looks good. Okay. Yep. Looks good now. Oh, okay. So, um, now we're talking about how can we capture all those like uh, hot spots and hot moments of biogeochemical processes at the river corridor scale. So we definitely need to do a lot of simplification so that we can simulate them at that uh, level. So what we did is we conceptualized a grid cell or like a river corridor unit um, in here. And for that unit, we will uh, use a reduced order model to characterize the exchange, hydrologic exchanges between the river and, uh, and the channel. And we specify the uh, uh, same set of reactions uh, across the entire uh, unit. And we apply the reaction rates that's from like lab experiments uh, and field experiments. And we found like we have to scale those reaction rates so that we can get close to what's really happening uh, in the uh, field. And the reason being like, if you remember the movie, it's like uh, the reaction rates are very different at one place to another, especially like beyond the riverbed, the uh, reaction rates are a lot slower. So that's the reason we have to scale the reaction parameters to uh, like lower rates uh, when we are dealing with like bigger units um, uh, at watershed scale biogeochemical modeling. And we also found from uh, one of our, our applications at, uh, you know, a similar watershed scale, we simulated hydrology and we showed the animations um, that what, what is uh, processed uh, at a given unit depends on uh, how much nutrient inputs uh, that is present uh, adjacent to that unit and what kind of uh, exchanges are happening between the river water and the groundwater. So this, we build this like river corridor model that can, uh, have, can allow us to specify the processes within a unit and link all those units together across the river, uh, like across this watershed to quantify what's happening at each place. And the, um, then the question is, how does, does uh, all the theory and tools you have learned from the summer school apply to that scale as well? So I am not going to repeat uh, this slide because I believe you have heard enough from uh, how you go from the um, omics or FTICR data to generate a reaction uh, network, we can incorporate into the uh, reactive transport model. Um, and you have uh, like both Hien and Kelly, they are heavily involved in this process. And um, uh, you, all this like pipelines are built in collaboration between um, like multiple projects funded by the uh, uh, Civil Service Biogeo chemical research program, one of them being the ideas watershed. Um, if you have heard like the brief introduction I did uh, before lunch, um, ideas watersheds are aimed to build like simulation tools as well as workflow that can uh, facilitate the uh, assimilation of information from a useful uh, data source and a theory to inform our uh, hydro and biogeochemical models. Um, then what, what, what that new theory and tool has made a difference is like, remember I showed you like three and uh, three or four uh, reactions uh, for that high resolution model we create. We uh, performed simulations with this uh, new omics or FTICR information combined it can generate thousands of reactions. We, uh, you know, we can include in our reactor transport model. 
Of course, we're not able to like incorporate all of them. And he helped us to like down select a reduced set of reactions um, we can use, which is like 10 uh, shown over here as, as an example. So you can see the reactions are a lot more, uh, say, um, complicated. It's not only in terms of the uh, um, number of reactions, but the species are, um, there's like more details in what kind of an organic carbon species is in each, uh, each like reaction. So the, uh, uh, our hypothesis would be like capturing all those nuances in this reaction network, along with the reaction kinetics, we will be able to better capture the hot spots and hot moments of uh, uh, reactions within our river corridor systems. And uh, we can uh, use the observations to validate our uh, assumption and also test our hypothesis. Um, then uh, this gives you a, a high level overview of uh, how this is a uh, uh, sorry, let me mute my Skype. So uh, this highlights our like entire strategy of incorporating the uh, small scale information from those omics and the other observations through the pipeline to generate the reaction networks and the kinetics to inform our river corridor model. And that river corridor model can be integrated into our watershed and a basin scale river corridor models to, to help us reveal the spatial and temporal patterns of reactions. And then we actually also use that information to guide where and when to collect our samples that can make the most impact to improve our models. This is a cycle we, uh, if you, um, talk to like uh, our colleagues here. Uh, we often mention this as like the MODEX, it's model experiment uh, iteration, MODEX cycle, or it's model data integration, uh, underpinning how we improve our predict models. Uh, in more implementation details, our goal is to quantify the carbon and uh, nitrogen cycling within the river corridor, and we will be used. Uh, you know, the spatial patterns may look like uh, the, the two we uh, high, you know, provided as an example over here. It's uh, the output we get from our river corridor model. And this model requires uh, three major inputs. One is uh, solutes in the river um, over here. And then we need to know how much exchanges are happening between the river and the groundwater. And we also need to know what reactions and how fast they occur at each place. Um, it's like, it's a lot of work to link all of them together, especially if we want a lot of uh, uh, fine details uh, plus fine mechanisms. That's why like in reality, when we're doing all this work, we, we take simplifications or we start from a simple place. For example, we start with steady state inputs to our system and steady state exchanges. We can use a reduced uh, set of uh, reactions that do not change over time and over space, like the one we used in our, uh, in our like high resolution 2D simulations. But, then the improvements we can make is like we can put like uh, we can bring in heterogeneity in the system and we can also bring in like dynamics in inputs to our river corridor through like integrated watershed modeling, uh, which we can talk uh, later. And to the most interest to this group is we can enhance what's happening within the river corridor and how that is impacted by uh, the other things we can measure like uh, dissolved organic matter, uh, pyrogenic organic matter, and what chemistry and microbial functions to, uh, to have a like um, say more accurate representation of our reaction mechanisms. And you might have, uh, you might figured out like this line, it's from this, uh, 
microbial function and all those information to generate reaction mechanism and put it into a model and then use to quantify our uh, like spatial patterns uh, of this uh, cumulative processing of carbon and nitrogen is the main scaling uh, line we have presented earlier. So this gives, this gives us one time snapshot. If we do this over time, what we'll be able to uh, see would be like if we uh, sit in one place, how do the concentration of nitrate or other species change over time? And this is like what we can observe in field, uh, like, like USGS is doing a lot of such monitoring. And then we can use that to evaluate how good our model is capturing such dynamics. Um, there's also the other thing we can do with the spatial predictions we have uh, uh, used our model to generate. Um, one interesting question to ask is like, what is controlling such spatial pattern? And we can, uh, we can imagine it's like the riverbed, uh, riverbed physical uh, properties and land use, land cover change of the, uh, 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 of the basin. And also the climate variables, it's like how much rainfall and how, how uh, warm or cold it is in each region, they might all come into play in controlling how much total nitrate is being removed in our system. So one way to uh, answer this kind of question is to take our model inputs and outputs and run through a uh, uh, like classification method uh, like machine learning based random forest model to see which variables are contributing the it or are explaining the most variability um, of like the spatial patterns of our model outputs. And we did like a, um, some analysis like that. And this is like the example of how random forest is helping us to classify our uh, like uh, this would be like the output uh, the model can generate. And those are the variables we suspect are playing a role. And then from the results from that, we can see first how the statistical or like machine learning model is capturing um, all these uh, predictions we generated from our uh, river corridor model. Uh, in this case, it's pretty good because the R square is like 0.9. And you can also see most of the points are along the one-to-one -one line. And we can also look into details of, of like which variable is explaining most of the variance. So from this case, like across the Columbia River Basin, we found the uh, a riverbed physical heterogeneity and the land use control uh, is the most dominant factors in determining the spatial pattern in total nitrate that is removed in our system. Um, then the next thing, uh, so that is work we have done. And then the thing, the, the research we are uh, planning to do in the future is really to uh, use like distributed sampling of uh, uh, all this uh, uh, DOM, PIOM, uh, and what chemistry and microbial functions through wonders, uh, like through the network like wonders. Uh, we collect th through the uh, uh, system and how can we use that information to inform our basin scale river corridor models. Um, if, if you're still with me, you, uh, like what this can impact is really the uh, uh, reaction mechanisms we can map across the basin scale. And then what we need to do is connect from those kind of distributed sampling to a dis distributed mapping of uh, the reaction network and the kinetics across the entire Columbia River Basin. So this is how we can uh, uh, utilize all those pipelines we have been building through like multiple projects by collaborating with our uh, fabulous community. So what we will do is with all those samples, we will extract the patterns in our data and then we run those uh, extracted patterns through our pipeline that will give us the uh, distributed um, 
the point samples of what the reactions and rates are looking like. And then we build, like say, some machine learning models that can help us to map what we can measure or what we can get from elsewhere to the reactions and rates we need in our model. If we build this mapping, then we will be able to use all the information we can get we can take full advantage of distributed sampling of this like wonders network to make our basin scale predict models uh, uh, more accurate. So, uh, and also like with, the, with this, we also talked about the other way to improve the uh, uh, river corridor biogeochemical model is to know better about what comes into our river and what, what is controlling the spatial and temporal dynamics of such inputs. Um, if you have heard, I talk for ideas and this is you know, uh, going to be a repeat of some information from that. So our what shared model can help us to accomplish that goal. But the key over this, like uh, the key of using what shared model to do this is to couple all those processes that are contributing to what ends up in the river in a mechanistic way and also can be computationally effective. So we will be uh, working very closely with the Ideas Watershed uh, project team to leverage the eco ecosystems the community has built for different purposes and we can build like interoperable interfaces to allow us uh, link different processes from different codes together. And by doing that, we will be, build, we will be able to build uh, a single code that can have all the processes we're interested in for this system. But this doesn't mean everyone has to use this code. You can have your own choice of, a, you, you know, you can have your own recipe that is best suited for your problem. Uh, for example, we can have a uh, P-flow train to simulate the biogeochemistry and we use ATS, it's another like uh, code developed by our community uh, to simulate the integrated hydrology for both surface and subsurface. And you can use uh, alchemia to link them together. And then you can choose Wolf Hydro or ERM for your uh, land surface or uh, like plants related processes. Um, and it's very important to perform rigorous uh, like comparisons across different um, model configurations and compare that with uh, data to help us decide what is the best model we can possibly build for a system for a variable we're interested in predicting. And uh, with this system in place in the end, it's like we want to, uh, like currently our river corridor is often treated as a separate um, component from the watershed. And we uh, do pass like mass and solutes uh, across those, uh, across river corridor and the rest of the watersheds. But in the future, we would really like to build, build an integrated model that we uh, refine our mesh in the river corridor, which we consider as the biogeochemical hotspots. And it's in one system of like the red of with the rest of the watershed model. So this is really what we're trying to accomplish. Um, with that kind of integrated um, simulation capability, what we will be able to do is to come uh, to capture how do the transport pathways vary under different conditions. Uh, it can be under a baseline condition, but can also be uh, after a fire. And what this transport pathway does is like it will bring different materials from different places to uh, the river. And when they change, you can imagine the, uh, the composition of, of the uh, chemistry in the river will change and also like the timing of like the concentration uh, uh, peaks or certain signatures will change because of the uh, change in what transport pathway as well. And we, we would like to know 
uh, it's uh, how the the changes in microbial function and also the organic carbon speciations will be coupled with this kind of a hydrologic changes to change the river corridor biogeochemistry as well. So with this, we can test hypotheses like what's controlling the short-term versus long-term effects of uh, extreme events like wildfire combined with extreme pre precipitation. The simulation capability opens the door for us to do that. And if we do our simulations to like say, uh, systems that are disturbed versus not disturbed, we can do paired watershed analysis to uh, analyze how do the fire history and uh, precipitation scenarios um, interact to alter the uh, hydrobiogeochemical regimes in the river and how does that change the river corridor biogeochemistry in the end. Um, like I have mentioned, in order to do a good job over there, we have to, uh, we have to integrate our model or we have to use like all the information we can find from a, a wide variety of measurements like the USGS monitoring stations, uh, Ameriflex Ameri Ameri Flex, Flex towers, remote sensing to parameterize our model and also to evaluate and improve our model. So we plan to use a lot of uh, machine learning methods uh, to help us integrate the information in our model and in our data. Eventually we build a, a great model for understanding the uh, uh, like river corridor biogeochemistry. So with that, I would like to say this is a daunting task to do well, to do it well. So that's why uh, the community involvement and like uh, to work with everyone who is interested in uh, studying such uh, systems and such science problems are very important. By doing it together, we will accomplish way more than what we can accomplish individually. And that I believe is also the purpose of doing this uh, uh, to, to have this summer school so that we can build a great community that are centered around the common goal and then we, we share our capabilities, we share our data. Um, in the end, we can understand much better of the uh, spatial heterogeneity and the dynamics of our system and how they scale from a single point to a watershed and to a basin and also to the entire United States or the globe. Wherever the wonders are taking us to uh, sample, we want to model with them so we get the best out of a distributed sampling network like Wonders. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And uh, it's really uh, nice to share like our research with you as well. So I'll take question later. Thanks. Thank you, Xing Yan. That was great. Um, I really appreciate the way you concluded there because I think you're you're completely right. This this summer school this week, um, I think one of the biggest outcomes is really coming together as a community, demonstrating to the the uh, the participants, the attendees, and the students, you know, what a community a community can do together. You know, when we sort of set aside our institutional boundaries or our um, you know, all of the things that tend to isolate us. And, and so this has been really, I think it's been really cool. And your, your talk was a great illustration of that. So thank you. Thank um, you. There have not been a huge amount of questions so far, at least nothing in the Zoom chat. There's some questions over in, um, uh, let's see, there's some questions over in the applications area um, of the, Discord chat and so and one in particular is asking about publications related to the models that you presented today So I know you have some papers you can share mm -hmm. uh, Are you um, if you're in the discord if you could head over there when you have a chance and check out those questions and, and share some papers with the with people so, Okay, sure. Yeah, any other uh, questions that people Want to post up in either zoom. Uh, I don't think I'm missing anything at this point. Let me see. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So hopefully, if there are more questions, people will continue the chat over in Discord. So thanks, Ching, and we'll we'll move on to the final presentation of the day, and of the summer school. So we have up Pamela Weisenhorn from Argonne National Laboratory, and uh, she, I believe, works on the Argonne National Laboratory SBR SFA. Pamela, are you available and ready to go? Yep. I'm here. Let's go ahead and start sharing the screen. And she is going to speak about omics informed reactive transport in wetland systems. Okay, looks great, Pamela. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, reactive transport modeling in wetland systems. So we've been talking all week um, about how to use omics to really incorporate microbes uh, into these models. Uh, and so I'm going to talk to you a little bit here about the specifics of and my thoughts about doing this within uh, these wetland ecosystems. And so in some ways, uh, my talk is going to be a little bit opposite of what you just saw, which I think presented a really great uh, synthesis and synopsis of sort of a, a bigger picture way that these things matter. Uh, and I'm actually gonna to go into these, these systems and I'm gonna look at all the, the challenges that are present within these systems and some potential workarounds for those challenges as we move, move forward. Um, but also because of the, the nature of the, the systems, the scale that I'm going to be talking about is, is much smaller as well. Uh, and I, I think that's sort of been a theme throughout the course is, is the importance of considering scale and what your question is in terms of how to apply and how to use these approaches. Okay. Um, so wetlands uh, is is a broad category of ecosystems. You know, wetlands are, are really diverse systems. Uh, that are found um, in freshwater inland wetlands that can be small and, and dry part of the time or seasonally flooded to sort of these permanently flooded coastal systems uh, that have a lot of salt influence. Um, and so even though, you know, we kind of all lump them together as wetlands, one sort of system, it's actually a bunch of different systems that each have different drivers and their different considerations uh, to be taken when we think about how we want to model and how we want to think about these systems. You know, so, you know hydrology is a, is a really strong key in all of them, and it's what links it and makes it um, sort of a really great topic and, and system to, to consider in terms of uh, integrating microbes into reactive transport models. Um, but there, there are a lot of other key drivers as well, you know, whether or not the system is tidal, you know, is how constantly flooded is it? Is it seasonally flooded? Is it flooded year round? How much does the water depth vary? Um, you know, what, what controls the water depth? Is it precipitation? Is it groundwater? Is it wind? Um, you know, is there salt present or no salt present? What kind of vegetation is present, right? So when we talk about wetlands, we can talk about anything from sort of these herbaceous dominated systems to um, tree dominated systems. And, and those work and function in, in very different ways. But one thing um, that wetlands do tend to have in common is that they're where terrestrial areas meet water, right? And, and as such, uh, they tend to be hot spots of biogeochemical activity because they have uh, a mixture of sources of nutrients uh, and, and other materials, and it's sort of the exchange between land and water. And so they tend to be hot spots, and so it's really important uh, to capture what, what's happening within these systems. So like I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the challenges, and I want to give you a, a little overview of, of what some of those challenges might be within these systems. And then I'm going to walk through a few case studies uh, where I sort of show and demonstrate how these challenges are sort of affecting the system, and then also present some of the, the potential workarounds or adjustments to the approach that you've been shown uh, that might help us incorporate this and, and really move forward in these important systems. Uh, so first off is, you know, community turnover along gradients, right? So we're talking about incorporating microbes into these models, um, but microbes aren't everywhere, right? And so uh, a lot of the common gradients in sort of these wetland ecosystems or these gradients and in interfaces between terrestrial and aquatic 
uh, are also really strong drivers of microbial community composition and diversity. Right, so I was talking about like in coastal systems, there's a, there's a really strong change in salinity. Uh, and in almost all of these systems, there's a change in flooding from the uplands to, to the standing water, right, where you get sort of this redox or oxic to anoxic gradient. And we know from uh, lots of studies looking at sort of broad level biogeographical patterns in microbial community composition, that salinity and redox are two of probably the top three factors that are really driving community composition. And so it's important to realize that as we move across these gradients, the microbes that are present in one location aren't necessarily gonna be present in another. And so we need to think about how we wanna incorporate that into the models. Another thing we need to think about is and that we talked about some is the, the role of interspecific interactions, right? So um, this is one thing that's, that's really unique to the biology aspect of, of biogeochemistry uh, and these modeling approaches is that in biology, life finds new and different ways to do everything, right? And so um, when we consider sort of these upland systems or sort of mostly aerobic sy systems, you know, a single organism is capable of, of going from a, a polymer that's present in, for example, plant litter, uh, using some extracellular enzymes, breaking it down to a monomer that can be taken up within the cell, and then doing all of the metabolic processing on that and then releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, right? So a single organism can actually go through all of these steps. Now we know in natural systems that's not often always the case and there are plenty of organisms that really specialize on degrading these polymers and then other organisms that kind of cheat and come in and, and steal the monomers. So we know that it's not usually quite that simple, um, but we know that it also can be, that the, the metabolic potential to do that is, is present in individual organisms. But then when we start thinking about anaerobic degradation, there are far fewer uh, organisms that can actually take a polymer, break it down into the polymer, and then bring that all the way down into um, uh, carbon dioxide and methane, right? So here you tend to get fermentative organisms that can make a single change, and then they excrete a waste product that's then used by another organism for another small modification. Um, and each of these, reactions yields less uh, thermodynamic energy and there's tend to be slower growth um, for these organisms as well. And so that has potential impacts on how we wanna model the microbes because if you take here a single genome metabolic model, you're capturing one of multiple steps in this pathway. Um, and so you have to consider whether for your question that's really, um, if that's really useful, or if we need to come up with a way to, to make models, some, some community models that represent these groups of organisms, and then we need to consider how these groups of organisms are responding to those gradients. Another thing that <laughs> is sort of a little bit swept under the rug, but I, I was very happy to see somebody ask uh, directly a question about this um, in uh, Discord earlier this week is, what about those quirky metabolisms, right? So metabolic modeling approaches, and it makes sense why, right? They've been developed for aerobic heterotrophic organisms. We started with E. coli, right? We, we started with these organisms that are easy to grow in the lab, we can study them, and we can test things so we can understand what their metabolism is, and then we use those as the basis of making the annotations that you use that tell us which reactions are to put into the metabolic models. Um, and most of these transformations are based off of the carbons and the atoms in the system. They're not based off of the protons and the electrons, which can sometimes go missing. Um, you know, I'm sure you notice that you don't actually specify a pH in the conditions when you're looking at the, these metabolic models. And so for that reason, some, some protons and electrons um, can kind of get kind of get mixed up a little bit. Uh, and that poses a problem for uh, metabolisms that really rely on the extracellular electron transfer. Now, Chris Henry and his group are doing a lot right now to, to be able to improve the, the capture of these things, um, but there's still sort of a, it's still sort of a gray area and something we need to consider. Um, in addition to that, just be, by the very nature of being less well studied, these metabolisms tend to have more misannotations when you're trying to, to figure out what's in the genome and fewer reactions that then get included into the draft models, et cetera. So the, model, the draft models themselves simply require more curation, right? 
So now I'm going to sort of walk you through some of these, these examples, systems, uh, and studies that show that, that these things are, are relatively common in, in these wetland ecosystems, but also how we can work around it, how we can keep moving forward and, and keep advancing this really exciting uh, idea and approach that, that we've developed and we've been talking to you guys about today, or through this past four week in the course. So my collaborators on this project, um, just want to give some quick announcements on that, is Loretta Battaglia, who's now the, the president of the Society of, Women, of Wetland Scientists, as well as Julia Terry. Um, and so this is a study that we conducted down at Grand Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve, which is uh, on the Gulf Coast uh, in the state of Mississippi. Um, so here's a picture of the site. And you can see this transition from the, the Gulf on one side to the pine trees, which are not particularly fond of, of flooding or salt um, within just the scope of this picture, right? And so the, the gradient that we're talking about here is 100 centimeters in elevation and less than a kilometer in distance. So if you'll think to the, the, the talk we just heard about the scale of grids um, and how we do these models in the system, this is, this is really relatively small. And along these gradients, we see that there's, there are four different plant communities. You can't capture all of them in the picture here. Um, but there's the pines here. There's salt tolerant grasses here. There's a mixture here, which you can kind of see the, the taller grass um, of brackish marsh species. So a little bit more diversity. And then in between, which you can't really see in the picture, uh, is a fresh marsh, which has a, a lot more species, uh, a lot more diversity in the system. Right. And so for this, we collected samples from four transects on, on four different of what we call pine islands because the islands are, the pines themselves are sort of surrounded in a sea of these marshes, not because they're surrounded by water. Uh, and looking at the microbial community composition, we see that there's a very strong gradient between these different sort of plant communities here uh, in terms of the microbial community composition. Um, and this has been uh, restructured so that the maximum variation explained in the um, variation in the community is, is along this x-axis, right? And so you see that this is pretty much a straight line along that axis as well. So the, the strongest driver here is sort of these overlapping flooding and salinity gradients that that very small change in elevation represents. And then I want to show you here, this, this Venn diagram shows the number of unique taxa um, that are present in each sort of combination um, or, you know, in an individual site along that transect. And what we see is that the majority of the species are found at only one of these locations and a very small number of species less than one and a half percent of the, the total number of species that we found at this site are present across the entire site, right? And so we're talking about microbes. They can, they can move, they can be dispersed very easily. There's a lot of water transfer. There are a lot of animal movements uh, through this really short uh, gradient. Um, but what we see is that the, the community almost completely turns over between the, the salt marsh and the pine woods in these islands. Right. And so when we're talking about community turnover, it's it's a really strong, sharp turnover. And this isn't just, um, you know, present there. This is actually a really common pattern. And so I found that same pattern in studies that I've done uh, in Weeks Bay, Alabama, which is a very similar system, but also at Elgin Air Force Base out in Florida. And in this, it's, it's along a river that has a salinity gradient in it as well. And so samples were collected from um, wetlands along the, the length of this river. Uh, and it, it, I, it's not just limited to the Gulf Coast either. Um, from some of the work that some of my collaborators have done, you know, I see this out in the Pacific Northwest as well. We, with the the overlay of salinity and uh, anoxia, you really get these strong gradients, right? So what does that mean for reactive transport models? Who knows? <laughs> you know, we haven't started incorporating microbes in, and so this is still really unknown ter territory. But if the functional redundancy is high, and Christoph uh, alluded to this in, in his talk earlier, the, the fact that there's community turnover may not actually pose too much of a problem for our ability to, to model what's happening here, but it's still something we need to consider as we're starting to incorporate genomes into these models. 
Um, but also if the community turnover is closely linked to the, the chemical turnover. So for example, in a, a coastal system, sulfate's gonna be present in seawater, but not in those freshwater sites. Um, so if you just lose sulfate reducers where there's no sulfate, that's not really gonna affect the performance of the model either. Um, but if, if those aren't the case, it may also be possible to deal with this using uh, different machine learning approaches, right? Uh, so if I look at the actual distribution of, of individual OTUs across this, and these are sort of the average point um, for each of those different zones, you'll see that, you know, they, they clearly sort of show a preference uh, in general, and they don't all have the same preferences. Um, but when I looked at the, from the subset of uh, less than one and a half percent of the taxa, 90% of those that were present across the whole gradient showed this sort of a zone preference, right? And so it'd be possible to use machine learning approaches uh, and not black box approaches like the neural networks that Hyun was talking to us about earlier, but uh, white or gray box machine learning approaches. And so what that means is that they can actually give you the underlying equations for the relationships that explain the distribution of these taxa. Then we can incorporate those relationships into the reactive transport models in a similar way uh, to how we'd uh, consider other external factors like Roloff was explaining um, yesterday in terms of you know, how pH might control the, the accumulation of biomass in the system. Right, so um, the, the community turnover is a challenge. It might be something that really affects us, but we, we have some alternative approaches and there are other ways uh, and other things to consider as we move forward. It's just something to keep in mind, right? So the, the next system I'm gonna talk about is one that's maybe not quite as strong in terms of the gradients, but where we still see um, some, some real differences in terms of um, what's happening here. And here in particular, I wanna focus in on the, the interactions. Uh, and so here's my, here are my collaborators uh, for this project. It's, it was a slightly larger project with more people. Uh, the study site is uh, one of the wetlands here at Argonne. Um, there, are th there are more than 30 wetlands on site and I study most of them for various reasons at different times. Um, but this is a, a permanently flooded inland wetland it has a water level control structure. Uh, so the water level tends to be pretty constant. It does drop a little bit more in the, in the summer when there's just not enough water because of evapotranspiration in the area. Um, it receives some, some treated lab waste water. So it's a little bit nutrient heavy, but it's, it's been treated, so it's not too bad. Uh, we collected water samples in the, the top five centimeters of sediment uh, roughly once a week for, for 50 weeks. And so in terms of, of the community, composition. Uh, looking at this, we see that it's relatively constant through time, right? So we're going to the same spot, we have relatively constant um, water depth. The other conditions are, are, are relatively similar as well. We still have changing seasonality and things. Um, and so what we see is, especially for the sediment, but you know, somewhat also for the water, we have relatively consistent community composition. Great, that helps us model things. We don't have the same problem that I was just discussing. Um, but there's a difference between the, the composition and the interactions of community members, right? And so I, I went ahead and I looked at the interactions uh, that were present in the, these soil microbial communities. So I focused in on the, the sediments here and I generated two types of networks. So I generated a single network that explained all of the data. And then I also looked at sort of 43 networks that were based on a sliding scale. So like week one through week eight, week two through week nine, et cetera. Um, and then sort of compared what happens as we look through it. So if we look at the interactions through time, what we see is that they change quite a bit. Right? So although the community composition itself is relatively stable, potential interactions between community members, the activity, what they're doing, uh, uh, changes through time. Uh, and I'm not actually going to show the whole video here because even though it's only two seconds, it does seem to take forever. But this is right here where I wanted to, sh to show you what happens, right? So initially you had sort of this large ball of interactions where most of the species were interacting with each other. And then that kind of fell apart for a while and you had sort of these smaller groups of species interacting, right? And then as we go through, it kind of, um, it kind of returns to where it was before. Um, so that's sort of the, the highlight of that. Um, but if we look at sort of these interactions, across all of the different networks, there were more than 60,000 unique interactions. 
but the vast majority of those, even though I'm using a sliding scale, so most of the data from, from one of those plots to the next is exactly the same, right? So one to nine, two to, or uh, one to eight, two to nine. So most of those overlap. 46,000, 72% of those were only found in a single network, right? And so we know that these species are sort of, um, can be interacting with each other in a, in a really flexible sort of way. And then, but there were some that were really common uh, and that were, were present in, in a good majority of the networks. And some of those were really interesting, right? So most of them were phylogenetically similar taxa. So maybe it was just the environmental conditions, the microbes were changing in the same direction with the environmental conditions. Um, but one that was particularly interesting was that there's a Nignavibacteriaceae, which is a, a primary fermenting organism, and then a, a Geobacter, right, and which uses primary fermentation products. And so there's a reason to believe that that's sort of a metabolic interaction, and it's one that could really influence how iron is being transformed in the system. I really link iron to the carbon that's present, and not just to the carbon that's present, but also to which species is using that carbon that's present. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind uh, as we are sort of moving forward. And another thing that was particularly interesting in this, so as we look at this sort of um, big picture of, of these interactions, right, across all of the different um, uh, the sampling points, we make a single network. Um, you know, we have just, just under 4,000 taxa. Um, so about, so under a quarter of the taxa that are present in the entire system is more interacting. We only have 12,000 interactions here. So most of those that, that didn't show up in, in the sliding scales also don't show up here. But we have 113 modules, which if you've looked at interaction networks um, from other uh, microbial ecosystems, uh, specifically sort of the, the uplands ecosystems, you tend to see one giant ball. All of the organisms are kind of interacting with each other um, to, to differing extents, but, but more or less loosely interacting with each other. Whereas here you see a lot of clusters that sort of break off uh, and are interacting with each other. And so these, con these consortia then um, are really only, only interacting with each other. Uh, and there seem to be a lot of them that are similar size and similar shape. And so, you know, if you think back to what I was saying earlier about um, the interactions um, in the system and, and how degradation of carbon happens, that it's a multi-step process involving many organisms, you can imagine, and it hasn't been shown, right? Because this is only 16S data and I haven't had the chance to, to go in and try to find all of the genomes of all of these species to see if that it, this theory makes sense. But um, it's easy to imagine that um, these taxa represent groups of interacting organisms based on that exchange of metabolites. Uh, and so if that's the case, uh, the question really here is um, with these small clusters, with these consortia of organisms, you know, how do we model the change from one consortia to another? What sort of an effect does that have uh, on the you know, overall transformation of elements in the system or, or how that transformation at a location changes with environmental conditions. And one of the great things about um, these reactive transport models is it really allows you to look at sort of how physical and chemical and biological changes are all interacting with each other. And so the, the question here really becomes like, how do these, um, this biology, these different consortia, do they respond in the same way or different ways to changes in the environmental conditions? Because that affects how we want, we want to model it and what we need to be thinking about when we try to incorporate it into models, right? And so there are plenty of examples um, in, the environment of how biology can outwit thermodynamics, right? And so, you know, it, we used to think, and I think Christoph uh, showed this sort of pretty well earlier, how, you know, sulfate reduction happens and then sulfate reduction stops and then methanogenesis starts um, because methanogenesis doesn't yield as much energy as, as sulfate reduction is not as thermodynamically favorable. And yet we've found that actually those things can, can, co can and do co-occur. Uh, and interestingly, you know, um, recent work has shown that methanogenesis and oxygen, 
oxygenated soils is a substantial fraction of the wet methane emissions from wetlands, right? And so methanogenesis um, wasn't even thought until <laughs> relatively recently to be able to occur uh, in oxygenated systems, uh, in part because a lot of the methanogens we knew about were very sensitive to oxygen, right? And they, they were not tolerant of oxygen at all. Um, and so, um, it's still possible for that to happen. And, and you know, uh, there's been some studies, and this is only bioarchive, bio right? So um, maybe hold your breath a little bit, but uh, cyanobacteria in both aquatic and terrestrial environments um, can also contribute to the formation of methane. And there's many, many examples of sort of where this paired metabolism allows processes to occur under otherwise unfavorable conditions. And so while using thermodynamics to, to model and to pick ideal pathways um, for what sort of processes are happening in a reactive transport model really makes a lot of sense. And the majority of the time, the vast majority of the time is probably perfectly accurate. Um, once we move into the, these systems where there's sort of more variability and redox and where the thermodynamic situation is a little bit different, um, it's something that we need to consider and, and examine a little bit more closely uh, what those assumptions mean and, and more importantly, how those assumptions affect our models, right? So it's not something that should stop us from using this, the thermodynamic approach, but it's something that we should pay attention to when we're evaluating that, thermo that model and how we discuss that model. Right. So uh, overall, what are this sort of abundance of, of over, um, interactions mean and how does this, this change, right? So for community turnover, you know, when we're in sort of this more stable system, you know, it's less likely to be important, you know, as we're sort of changing through time, but it's not really very much. And even when we do see the changes, there's a greater probability of functional redundancy because the you know, environmental, um, the physical and chemical conditions are more similar, you know, and, and should it pose a problem here, we could, could sort of employ some of the same adaptive approaches I described before. Um, but for the interactions, there's a lot more questions. There's a lot less known about what's actually happening in the environment in terms of interactions. You know, it's, this is one of the, the big unknowns right now in microbial ecology is how common are interactions in the environment and how important are they for, you know, understanding how microbes are impacting uh, ecosystem processes, right? And so one thing that we can sort of view to, uh, approach we could take here is doing some of the the poor scale modeling uh, that Christoph was talking about. Okay, so if we do this really detailed, you know, this, this more detailed modeling where we can kind of get at these interactions or we can put different species, you know, spatially um, located differently um, and we can see how thing exchanges, metabolic exchanges are happening between them and the sort of the time scales that that's happening on or more reasonable time scales to how quickly that's happening. How does that impact what happens at the bigger scale, right? And so how does that spatial distribution at the micro scale matter for the macro scale? And how redundant are these consortia? You know, is it having a big impact on what happens? And can we substitute in one consortia for another in these models? And, and then what sort of the sensitivity of that? How much does it change our model output? Right, and depending on the results from that, we may need to, to develop approaches um, to generalize and to, to combine these things, to bend them, if you will, um, into different sort of groups so that we can still use these modeling approaches and, and really understand how microbes are impacting the system. But this is sort of one of those great places uh, where the MODEX approach really comes in handy, right? So let's you know, go ahead and, and make some microbial transport models. Let's see what happens and see how it compares to reality and see where we need to, to make some of these adjustments. Yeah. And so, you know, those were a couple of examples and I'm gonna go through here maybe um, just one more. These, these, are, these will be sort of a couple of little brief vignettes really um, from the work that I am doing with the Argonne Wetland Hydrobiogeochemistry SFA. Uh, this project is sort of 
very recently started. So we just got a new field site. We're adjusting everything to that. And then, um, you know, with COVID and everything, we haven't been able to get out there very much. And so there's a little bit less data here, but I still want to talk a little about, about what we're doing and sort of how that um, ties in with the, the ability to sort of use uh, the, this sort of approach to incorporate um, microbes into reactive transport models. And so uh, here's my collaborators for that project. Okay, so the study site for this is the Thames Branch, uh, which is a creek at the Savannah River site. I don't know how familiar uh, you guys are with, with DOE sites, but uh, the Savannah River site is uh, heavily impacted uh, with uh, legacy waste. Um, there is, uh, you know, a, our field site in, can, includes both a control and a contaminated area where the contaminated area is um, very strongly impacted by uh, just some de depleted uranium releases as well as heavy metals, uh, right? And so these have had a, a really big impact on, on the environment, but it also makes it very important that we understand uh, with really good detail um, what's going on in this system, right? Uh, so the Thames branch uh, empties into to Three Mile Run, which empties into the Savannah River, uh, which uh, the good people of, of Georgia use as drinking water. Um, and so it's, it's important for us to, to understand what's happening, what transformations are, are happening with the, the uranium at various levels in order to, to keep water quality high and for us to understand what's happening with that. And so as part of the SFA, we have um, multi established multiple sites along the creek, uh, and these are in sort of ecologically distinct areas, and we've as much as possible tried to control those in the contaminated and un uncontaminated zones. And they encapsulate both sort of the, the, the stream and stream bed as, as well as um, the wetlands on, on the sides of the, the stream bed. Okay. And so the, a brief study that I did to sort of trying to characterize the microbial community at this site, uh, you know, I, I sampled, uh, um, took soil samples, again, sort of at the very shallow depth, zero to five centimeters uh, throughout the watershed. Uh, and I focused on differences in, in the ecological parameters in order to sort of focus on this. And so some of those differences included, you know, it being the contaminated versus uncontaminated sites, disturbances. There are a lot of disturbances in this forest. It's a, it's a relatively large and natural forest. Uh, there's a lot of wild boar, though, that like to dig and make wallows. So we have some wallows included in that, for example. Um, uh, different plant communities. So some areas are herbaceous dominated and some are tree dominated. A slope and aspect. So right near the right near Thames Branch, it tends to be relatively flat, and we get sort of some of these formations of wetlands. Um, but it, it does rise. This is so, sort of the the foothills of the Appalachians. So it's it's nothing that somebody from the Rocky Mountains would even call a hill, probably. But to to people from the Delta in Louisiana and Georgia and those systems that I was just telling you about, that it it seems like there's quite a bit of topography there, uh, as well as sort of the position along the creek. And so one of the things I wanted to pull out here in, in particular is sort of an even smaller scale version of what I was talking about with Green Bay, um, which is looking at hummocks and hollows. So sort of just these, these raised areas at, at the base of trees um, and sort of lowered areas in between uh, tree trunks that occur typically in sort of these southeastern wetlands. And so just these differences in, in, to, in topography, like we're talking less than 10 centimeters, probably most of the time less than five centimeters um, of difference uh, in, in elevation between these, these locations. Um, and these were all paired samples. Um, can result in this difference, the separation of communities. And it's a separation of communities that you can see here uh, in spite of all of the other variation, right? So these things weren't pushed together because they're underneath the same um, plant species or because they have very similar hydrologic regime or they're in a similar part of, um, you know, the, the similar location along the creek, right? There, there's this particular set of hummocks and hollows um, is from the control site. So that had control versus heavy metal contamination between, between the disturbance of, of a pig wallow. Um, this actually still comes out as one of the, the stronger drivers. And again, this ordination is, is 
um, spun so that the, the maximum variation is, is along this x, y axis, right? And so we're talking about these really small changes in microtopography, something that you're unlikely to capture uh, when making sort of these larger scale reactive transport models um, or really having a difference in what community members are there. Now, the other thing that we're really focused on here at the site, uh, we're looking at um, the formation of iron oxide blocks, right? And so one of the, the goals for this is to sort of model the effects that these blocks uh, are having on uranium transport. Because you know, we went out to the site, we, you know, sometimes these blocks are present, sometimes they're not. They're really um, discrete in terms of their, their temporal occurrence, um, as well as their spatial occurrence. But the samples that we took from them contained particularly high concentrations of uranium relative to sort of the background sediments in the area and the water itself. And so we think that these are probably pretty important for understanding uh, what's going on with uranium and uh, water quality in general in the system. Um, but the, the challenge to try to create a model where we're looking at, you know, both the, the microbial aspect of, of the formation of the flock and, and what's the transformations happening in the flock, you know, obviously as well as sort of the flow, water flow is going to impact when the flocks are forming and when they're not in the chemistry of the system, is that they're really actually taxonomically and metabolically diverse mats. So when we looked at the community composition here, we found iron oxidizers, of course, um, but we also found uh, some methanogens and some methanotrophs and some sulfate reducers uh, and a, a whole slew of, of different types of organisms that are doing different things um, within you know, what appears to be a very iron rich, a, a uniformly iron rich um, microbial map, right? Um, another challenge with looking and modeling iron oxidation is that it can occur both biotically and abiotically and sort of parsing that out um, is really important in order to capture it in the model. And even to add to that challenge even more, iron oxidizing metabolism and physiology is, is pretty poorly studied. It's not super well known. Um, you know, if you take a genome and you try to annotate it for for iron oxidizing genes, it's, you know, you're going to run into a lot of trouble. Uh, and so if we were to take a genome from this and to try to plug it into to K base and tr make that draft metabolic model, we'd get a draft metabolic model out, but the chances that it's going to actually uh, oxidize iron are, are very small, right? And that's, um, that's one of the challenges of working with this metabolism. It's not sort of a, a downside to K-base or something that K-base can't do that other, other things can do. It's that actually making metabolic models of some of these metabolisms is a, is a really challenging task. And so for that, uh, you know, the best po potential solution that I could come up with is collaborate with somebody who knows what they're doing here, right? Um, and so, you know, I'm working on a project in, in collaboration with, with someone who's really deeply studied iron oxidation, right? So she knows how to try to get at the, the kinetics of the iron oxidation and, and distinguishing it between biotic and abiotic, um, as well as, as having a good understanding of the metabolism. Right? And so by, by doing this, by taking this sort of focused approach, um, I think that that can really improve our ability to make models of this. Um, but it's not something that's, you know, sort of a, a one week we can sit down and, and go from, from having some omic data to, to having sort of a rough way to integrate it with the reactive transport model. Uh, it's something that was going to require a lot more time, a lot more knowledge, a lot more curation to develop. There's certainly not a, a a problem it doesn't stop anything from happening but it is a challenge uh, in terms of, of moving this forward and, and getting things done so with that i just want to kind of do a, a brief recap here uh, so it, at the summer school you know you've been exposed to this this workflow uh, you've, you've gotten some hands-on experience some of, at least some of you with the, the approaches that you can use um, you know, and I think that this is a, an exciting um, way to um, sort of link all of these different omics data and to improve our ability to, to make um, good predictions with reactive transport models, you know, and, you know, I really want to, I'm sure you guys picked up on it, but in case it hasn't there at this point, you know, I really want to acknowledge uh, Hyun's role in, in developing a, a lot of this workflow uh, conceptually as, as well as doing a lot of the work. Um, 
you know, that's why he gave so many talks and, and did such a great job with that. Um, you know, I, I'm really excited about this and I think it's gonna, you know, really um, lead to some advances and that more often than not in most systems for most questions, uh, using this approach is gonna be a, a really great way to move forward. Uh, but in some situations and some conditions uh, and depending on your question, uh, some adjustments may be necessary. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you know, some of the things that, that I could foresee. And you know, a lot of you had asked questions sort of around these lines about, well, but what if? Uh, and those what ifs I think are, are really where the, the interesting uh, changes and adjustments are, are needed. You know, and so um, to sort of to recap that, so the, the turnover along the gradients, um, you know, some of the things that we can do here are to incorporate some, some maybe some different uh, machine learning approaches to try to capture uh, how those, the microbial distribution is changing along the gradient. Um, for the interspecific interactions, um, you know, some of the things we can do are sort of look at these poor scale models and see if we can use those to sort of uh, incorporate um, the differences and how that's happening in different locations and to do some of that scaling as well as to sort of understand the impacts of and functional redundancy in, in different consortia. Uh, and then for the sort of the quirky metabolisms, the, the things that we don't know very well yet um, or the things that, you know, have some, some of these uh, weird electron issues, the best thing we can do is just sort of iterate, uh, iterate with the curations, um, find the people, the physiologists, physiologists always get overlooked in things like this, um, who really know the systems really well and, and tap into the, the existing knowledge um, as well as try to build knowledge uh, in order to, to improve our ability and other people's abilities to, to automate this and to advance it moving forward. So as you embark on, on the journey of, of trying to use uh, some of the, the skills that you've learned this week in this course, um, you know, you remember that, you know, as always, you, still, you need to match the question and the data and the model. Uh, and that's going to be sort of very system and very question dependent how you're able to do that. Um, but it's, it's going to be possible, even if you have challenges, there's always going to be workarounds. And so don't let hitting, hitting the wall once uh, to, to stop you from moving forward. You know, this is a, a very cutting edge area. There's gonna be a lot of bumps along the way. Uh, some of them we might be able to foresee and kind of plan out and some of them we won't be able to. Um, but, you know, I think that this is really gonna, um, these approaches are gonna really be able to improve our, the predictive ability of these reactive transport models. But also in addition to, to just improving that, it's gonna help us um, both the adjustments that we need to make, considering what those are, uh, as well as um, just iterating on the model and experiment design, um, can tell us a lot about the components of the models themselves. And so here I've been talking a lot about sort of the microbial ecology of that. Um, and so this can tell us a lot about sort of what things we don't know. For example, you know, we right now we don't really know how common interactions are in the environment or how much they matter for ecosystem processes. One really great way of trying to figure that out is to take what we know now and try to put those microbes into this into these reactor transport model frameworks and see how big of an impact it makes. See what the sensitivity of those models is to changing those microbial parameters. Uh, and we can really sort of start to explore um, in, a, in a more controlled and, and guided way um, using Modex sort of how that how that happens, how, how important are interactions, what are the effects that they're having, where are they having those effects. And so lastly, I just want to thank all of you. It's been really exciting to me um, to see your and hear your enthusiasm uh, and your excitement about doing this. And I think that we're really developing a, a strong community here that can, can work to develop these approaches. Um, and yeah, I'll, I guess I have a, maybe a couple minutes for questions or whatever you want to do, Tim. Yeah, yeah, we've got some time for some discussion. Thank you, Pamela. That was a great way to wrap up the workshop. And um, <laughs> there's a lot of interest. Well, so one thing is, um, like Xingyan, people were asking if you have some papers that you can share. Um, how to add papers to the Discord messages is, is apparently a little tricky. I tried to add one, and um, it said it was too big. So. Um, if anybody has uh, some help over there in Discord can suggest how to add paper links 
um, that would be helpful. But um, actually, there was a whole bunch of discussion around and, and, and interest in your interaction diagrams. And so, okay. um, <laughs> so I'm going to, uh, there was kind of two, two threads of questions around that. One has to do with sort of what underlies them. So, you know, really, what, what does interaction actually mean? What are the data that you're using to provide interaction information? How do you actually determine interactions? And then right. the second thread is kind of what are the software that you use and how, how do you actually implement that? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll answer them in the, the thread order that you presented there. So um, in this case, and, and in most cases, I think the, the interaction networks um, are derived from sort of 16S data, which it, it really captures um, sort of the, the taxonomic abundance of, of organisms. Uh, it does that in a a perhaps more straightforward um, and in-depth way than a lot of metagenomics approaches can. So metagenomics is, shotgun metagenomics is great in that it tells you all of these genes and all of these functions. Um, but when you're, you're interested in who's they are focusing on the, the 16S RNR, uh, RDNA gene, the ribosomal gene, um, which is what we as uh, microbial ecologists use to classify organisms, um, focusing in on that target gene really gives you um, much better uh, resolution uh, and you can get much better depth. And it also happens to be a lot cheaper so you can take a lot more samples. Um, so it, it kind of works well for all of those reasons. And so in considering what makes something an interaction, what you do is you take samples and in, in this case, um, you know, I, I try to limit it to, to no fewer than eight. Um, that's just sort of my personal cutoff on, on what I think is reasonable. Um, but you, you look at whether or not the species are changing in ways uh, that would indicate that they might be interacting, right? So do the species abundance go up together? Uh, do they go in opposite directions? Do they go down together? Um, and for, for doing this, a lot of people, and there are, there are a number of approaches, and I'll, I'll post a, a paper that kind of gives an overview of many of them, um, that just use sort of correlation-based approaches. But um, in, in this instance, uh, what I've done to, to try to capture some nonlinearity um, is uh, use mutual information, which allows you to say, I, um, knowing the uh, relative abundance of A, this is the relative abundance of B, how much do I know about that? And then you know, B to A as well. Um, but then even just doing that, you get a lot of, a lot of false positives. Like this, this method is, is very much known to have a lot of false positives. Things aren't actually interacting, they just are apparently interacting. Um, and that explains probably a lot of that, oh, well, it appeared once in that, that series of, of um, sliding windows, right? Um, is that correlations happen by chance. Um, so what I've done is I've developed a, a random matrix theory-based approach, which looks at sort of the distribution of the significance of those interactions to try to tease out signal from noise based on those distributions. Um, and that's just sort of a, a at least mostly uh, objective approach as to where to, to draw the cutoffs. Uh, a lot of researchers will just set a cutoff of a super, super low p-value in order to throw out a lot of the false positives or only take the top 100 um, strongest interactions and, and look at those. Um, so, but my approach has been to, to try to use sort of this objective cutoff and then, as you saw, to compare multiple different interaction networks to each other and see which interactions are consistent. Um, because if there's an interaction that's, that's consistently happening, it may not always be the strongest, but then it'll, it'll still appear there. Um, so that's sort of what, what I've used there. It doesn't necessarily mean that the species are in fact interacting. And so what you need to do that uh, is to, to pull out inf other information on the species, like I did with the Ignavibacteriaceae and the Geobacter, um, we know enough about those that we can hypothesize what that interaction would look like. And so you could feel good that those are interacting. Whereas the ones that I didn't label, um, and I, I mentioned this earlier, were phylogenetically similar. So they might just be um, not very far evolutionarily diverged and responding to the environment in the same way that gives that sort of apparent pattern. And there isn't right now a clear way to distinguish between those things. Um, what's happening in terms of environmental filtering versus when the organisms are interacting, uh, besides diving a little bit deeper. Uh, as far as, as software, um, 
and just sort of keeping an eye on time here too. Um, you know, I'll, I'll post uh, in there a, a review, sort of a, an overview paper that I've, I've written um, that describes a few of the different ways to deal with that. Um, but I'll also sort of put in a plug here for KBase. Um, I'm actually currently uh, implementing uh, my approach in KBase as well as a lot of other uh, tools and, and ways to look at this 16S data in KBase and do some of these analyses. Um, and so that will also be available in KBase Hopefully soon. I have a student who's, who's trying to get it done for a summer project in the next couple of weeks. So we'll see if that actually happens. It'll probably take a little tweaking after that, but uh, uh, it, it's coming together pretty nicely in terms of, of getting the app designed and, and made. So, oh, I can't hear you, Tim. I'm sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> I had noise over here, so I didn't want to get too much background. Um, yeah, that, that sounds exciting. Um, It'd be great to have that in KBase. So, and I, I think a lot of people also agreed that your your diagrams with all the interactions are very artistic. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, one other, a couple other questions. Um, I know we're a little over time, but I'm going to keep going anyway. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> do you have any plans to do these type of studies in seasonally flooded wetlands to see how they compare to permanently flooded wetlands? Yes, and I actually have, um, so I, I showed you the, the one Argonne Wetland Complex site. Um, I actually have 10 sites that I've been monitoring um, on my third year now, um, taking these samples. And so some of those are um, permanently flooded, three of those are, are permanently flooded. And then I have a couple that are seasonally flooded and a couple that are ephemerally flooded. So they flood after big rain events or big snow melt events, um, but are dry the rest of the year. So I am looking at it across a lot of different systems. Yeah. Great, great. Um, there are some other questions over there for you. So, and also just some, uh, some generally positive feedback. So I encourage you, um, Pamela, if you have a chance to head over to Discord a little bit and, and um, chat with some of those, some of the participants a little bit more. So I think at this point, we're gonna wrap things up. We are at the end of our time for the public part of the summer school. And, um, so I think uh, I'm, uh, I'm kind of overwhelmed as far as what to say. I'm really glad that everybody participated. And even, to, even right now, we still have 100 people online. So it's exciting, you know, this late in the day. And um, a huge shout out to, you know, the instructors, the, the K-Base team, you know, all of those people did a great job and, and made this happen. Um, definitely to Kelly and her, her lab, to Yun, and, and all the work he put into it, uh, the reactive transport modeling groups, Kuwe, thanks for all your help um, yesterday, and, and Roloff and Becca, and, and uh, you know, Michelle, everybody was, it was a really fantastic um, showing. And I think the thing to me that was most exciting was just seeing really this community come together and really a very diverse group of people. You know, we, we have, you know, very different kind of worlds that many of us live in on a daily basis. So it's great to get everybody together. And now they're starting to chop trees in my backyard again. So I'm going to mute myself and let Nancy say anything else she wants. Hey, I, I also want to echo uh, Tim's thanks to everyone. Um, this is beyond my expectations, any expectation I had in terms of the success and impact. I think to me, what was most exciting was just listening to the, the students present their research and their thoughts about how what they learned here would impact how they would do science in the future. My, my only wish is that you, uh, the students had able, would have been able to come on site and spend more time together because I see this as a cohort of our future, really taking what we've given here and moving it forward. And, um, that I, I hope that you can, maybe this generation will connect over the ether sphere and maintain the connection as a team and keep pushing. Um, it's so exciting where we are right now and uh, what we can accomplish. And um, just thank you so much for everyone for their participation. Great, thanks Nancy. And um, yes, thanks everyone. Um, we're gonna head over now to 
the student breakout rooms. And so we're going to drop off of this Zoom. Uh, the students can join us back on the other Zoom channel. And we'll spend a little bit of more time wrapping up a couple more hours here, finishing up the week. So uh, again, thanks to everyone who joined in this week. Please contact us. Stay, stay on the, I'll leave the Discord chat open for a while. And if people want to continue discussions there, that would be great. Um, hope to see you again soon. Bye, everyone.